645 will call this meeting to order. First item on the agenda is the acceptance of the agenda. So moved to second. Moved to second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Uh, we have a, a couple of items. Uh, Wampatuck signage. Al, is that yours? Or? I believe that is the Officer Thompson is here. Yeah. Is he? Oh, there he is. I'm sorry. Thank you. I didn't see you there. Thank you. you. If you would just introduce yourself uh, for the record. and Mark Thompson with Sitchwood Police. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark. Uh, can you fill us in on what this is about? Absolutely. There's been a uh, growing concern over the course of the year with the traffic problems at Wampatuck. Yep. Um, there's some thought that's perhaps due to the fact that it's a late school, um, due to the fact that just a lot more parents are driving potentially because of the busing fees, but the traffic volume that's going on at Wampatuck, the facility just can't handle the amount of cars that are going through there. Uh, so I've been working with Linda Whitney, with the chief, with uh, Mr. Banger from DPW to try to come up with some solutions. Uh, there are a lot of solutions that have been laid out, but a lot of them have a price tag associated with them. Um, as far as some construction workers, things that could happen. So those are probably longer term. Uh, so we've been trying to come up with some ways to get the traffic flow a little bit differently. The morning is a different problem than the afternoon. Um, so you've got in the afternoon people who are coming and trying to park, and there aren't enough places for people to park. There was concern that the way the parents were parking, uh, kids were running across, running in front of the school bus pass, in front of the turnaround and things. So they're trying to alleviate that problem from happening. Uh, this came about because of the morning traffic get people who are trying to pull out of the northbound uh, parking lot, either going north on Tilden Road or south on Tilden Road. People who are trying to turn left across Tilden Road is creating more traffic problems. Um, and this is also the same path where the children are coming across if they're going down Tilden Road. So uh, Ms. Snow is there, the uh, crossing guard is trying to handle things, but there's a lot of traffic volume there. So the idea is to put the no left turn sign there so that any traffic coming out of that lot that's on the north side of Wampatuck School would have to take a right hand turn they wouldn't be cutting across the traffic and would allow the flow of cars to get out of the parking a lot, a lot easier, not back up on a Tilden Road, uh, and it will allow Miss Snow an easier time with, uh, with dealing with the traffic. Thank you. Uh, Officer Thompson is a traffic officer, in case uh, anyone didn't know. We thank you for all you do in that area, too. Uh, why don't we open up to the board for any questions? Just a quick question. When you send people to the right there, mm -hmm. how are they going to, if they want to go south, what are they going to do? Well, I mean, are we just causing a problem? No, we actually haven't away. Seen, seen a problem occur with people going up. I haven't really seen people doing a lot of U-turns or anything like that. I think people are going to continue down Tilden Road, follow it up to the intersection of Captain Pierce, and maybe loop around that way. Um, you may have some people who decide to turn right down one of the Avs, Irving or Gardner or something like that, mm. and then come up happily. <clears> road. Um, but we haven't seen people going down, pulling around and doing a U-turn, because I think people realize if they're going to do that, they're going to just get themselves back into the traffic mess that was there in the first place. Okay. Yeah, because we don't want turnarounds of people yard exactly. and that sort of stuff. Exactly. Further comments they on the drop, board, John? Do they drop off at the other parking lot? They don't drop off in the other parking they lot. They just, just the, that. Primarily. The, that other parking lot is so full with the staff parking. Right. Um, that if people were to go in there, there's also not an easy access into the school itself on that side. Right. So if they're dropping one of the kids off over there, they'd either have to walk around the school or right. get some other type of access. Yeah. Uh, Makes sense. How are, uh, Role, I guess, would just be to to vote to install a signage uh, that Mark mentioned. Any further comments from the board? From the floor? Yeah. Motion. Put a motion. Move the board of selectmen vote to grant the traffic rules and regulations committee request to install signage at the Wampatuck School South Parking Lot at Tilden Road to read no left turn weekdays from 7:30 a.m. to 9:30 a.m. Second. Motion was made and seconded. Discussion from the board. From the floor. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thanks Thank you. Thank Thanks you for all you do, too. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Safe routes to school. Gentlemen, welcome. Evening. If you wouldn't mind introducing <coughs> yourself uh, for the record, we'd appreciate that. I'm Jim Cope. I'm with the Office of Transportation Planning for the Massachusetts Department of Transportation. Uh, Kevin Dandreid, Principal and Project Manager with TEC, a consultant to MassDOT. Kevin, yeah, Kevin, yeah, we know. Uh, 
Gentlemen, why don't you take it and, and, and kind of bring us up to date. We, we, we have received some letters of communication, so we, we are somewhat knowledgeable on the subject, but certainly not as knowledgeable as you and as would like to be. Okay, well, uh, it's good that you got some information in advance. Uh, you won't has, have to listen to us quite so long. Um, the uh, Safe Routes to School program uh, since 2005 has been a federal, federally funded program to in provide uh, facilities and to encourage kids to walk or bicycle to school uh, rather than being dropped off by parents uh, or um, other means. So um, the idea is rooted in some public health concerns about kids not getting exercise. It's rooted in air quality concerns about excess traffic at schools. Uh, and uh, it's also rooted in traffic issues um, where you get congestion uh, around schools. So there are lots of benefits uh, to having uh, kids uh, walk or bicycle to school. Uh, we recognize that it's not always safe for them to do that. And so this program is, is intended to address all of the aspects of, uh, of safety in regard to uh, kids walking and bicycling to school. So part of that is what's called the infrastructure program. And 70 to 90 percent of the, of the federal funding that the state gets for this program is to go into infrastructure improvements such as sidewalks, crosswalks, traffic signals, uh, and, and other uh, improvements. So uh, the other feature that's kind of unusual is that the funds are 100% federal. There's no state or local match. Uh, the only responsibility uh, for the town, other than to be supportive, I mean, we, we don't want to be coming into a community that doesn't want the program, uh, is to uh, take care of any, any right-of-way issues that there may be that are incidental to the, uh, to the improvements that are agreed upon uh, for the projects. So I'd like to turn it over to um, Kevin Dandrade, who is our engineering consultant, um, and he can talk about um, what is uh, envisioned for Situate. Thank you. Is it okay if I take the microphone and yep. talk to the board? Whatever you'd like. Yep. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, um, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, we've been involved in the Safe Routes to School program for over two years now, working with. Make sure it's on. It is okay. Uh, to look at the infrastructure component, um, I apologize if, if I'm blocking the view for anyone behind me. Um, what we do is do an inventory of what sidewalks exist in the area surrounding the school. We look at the crossing locations, where the most of the children are coming from are there dense neighborhoods are there other feeder streets that come in and where we can focus on particular improvements as we met with uh, principal Fitzmorris and other folks within the community um, there are a number of areas where there are gaps in the infrastructure in situate there are other areas where there are critical crossings that we've identified uh, as part of the what we call the preliminary assessment which was issued to the town in October um, it has a number of graphics and maps that look at this inventory and locations of recommendations. Um, our team came up with a number of different ideas within the one mile radius as required by the Commonwealth surrounding the Hatherley School. We identified things such as a sidewalk on the east side of the driveway so that children coming from the east side don't have to cross the driveway itself to get to the front door. We identified the section on Hollett Street which at the time of the assessment was limited up to Bullrush Farm Road, as well as some other sidewalk improvements out on Tilden. Uh, what we heard from the community and from staff was that uh, they'd like us to focus on the Hollett Street sidewalk for its entire length from Ann Vinyl up to Gannett to tie in with what's under construction right now, to have a great connectivity of sidewalks for folks coming from that entire area. <coughs> so what we, what we did was we went back and we looked at the feasibility for the sidewalks to be constructed on Hollett Street. Uh, Gannett Street is shown right here, and those sidewalks are ending in this vicinity. We would seek to take it from that end, wrap around the corner, 
come up the hill, have a new crosswalk at Sedgwick with some new ADA ramps, continue further to the south along Hollett, and then cross somewhere near the crest of the road so there's good visibility just north of Bullrush Farm. This is an area where, um, if you're familiar with it, there are slopes coming <coughs> in from either side. So there's the likelihood of, or potential for retaining walls and temporary or permanent um, property impacts in this area that will be identified as part of design. Uh, this is truly just a concept. We'd have a crossing of Bullrush Farm Road itself and a new sidewalk that pulls everybody from the neighborhood as well as everybody from Gannett Road down to Ann Vinyl. And that way most of the folks that are coming from the neighborhood itself don't have to cross the street. They can stay on the same side of the <coughs> road and continue down to the school. The total estimated project cost, which is 100% federally funded in design and construction, is estimated to be just shy of $470,000. And that's in line with what the sum of the other three primary projects was originally. So um, MassDOT has identified it as a, a project that they'd like to move forward with. There's a long process in front of us, um, but it really starts with this board here tonight to make sure that there's a warm embrace of the concept such that MassDOT feels comfortable moving forward in performing field survey, engaging in our services for design, and then coming back to the public for public hearings to discuss the design itself. Uh, we've been working well with uh, Kevin Cafferty um, and other folks in the town. Um, there are great parent champions like Barbara Lydon, the principal that have been involved for a very long time on the encouragement and enrichment aspects. And this is an opportunity to bring infrastructure to situate that will further complement those activities. Thank you. I think Kevin? I just think it's a great opportunity to get federal money um, in improving the sidewalks and situate. Um, Barbara Lydon's done a great job. Jim Cantwell's done a great job pushing this project along. And uh, we're looking for support for the selectmen for these guys to continue going on with their uh, design and funding for the project. Great. Uh, let me open it up to the board, Rick. Uh, I really don't have any substantive, substantive question to ask. I support this, you know, 100 million percent possible. I think this is a wonderful thing. I would have no problem with the, I, I understand that the town incurs all costs associated with legal review, document preparation, appraisals, right of way, and easement purchases, and I have no problem committing us to that. This is, this is outstanding. That's all I have. Yeah, I agree. This could be the easiest decision we have to make all year. <laughs> <laughs> the, the plan itself, we got it months ago, and it was so comprehensive. And there's this project has been on the list, I think Al said, for the last several years in the top five areas. And there's other areas that are like this. And I've, I've literally given them the plan and said, put something this together, and it really sells itself. So this is, this is great. And it, I like the fact that it, it gets kids in from all different angles. You know, it's... There's a ton of kids that live up in that area, and there's paths through the woods, and there's sidewalks in all these different areas, and I think it's great. So I support it. Sean, any comments? <clears throat> Wonderful idea. Uh, just one quick question for you, Kevin, and that was, uh, will it be a regular, I, did I see grass separation between the sidewalk and the street? Were you able to do that? Um, well, the, you don't have to. Well, actually, uh, I think it's I'm glad you said something, because otherwise I would have forgotten to turn to the next sheet. What um, I had, one of our graphic interns do was to put together together a rendering of what it might look like uh, in front of the um, um, some of the properties right along Hollett. Um, you can see the slope of land as it comes off the rock wall down to the street edge. And in order to put in um, curbing, whether it's asphalt or granite, and those details are still yet in front of us, you'd build a shelf for the sidewalk, and then you'd have to cut into the earth, and that would have to be sloped back. Um, ideally, we would put a grass strip between the roadway Just and the front of the sidewalk, but that would likely have more significant private property impacts, slope issues, tree removal, and we're trying to minimize those impacts. So having the sidewalk immediately adjacent to the road, we would look to do what we've done in some other communities, which is also to stripe an edge line for mm -hmm. traffic. So it gives the appearance of having a more narrow lane, and it, it does have a, um, a role in reducing speed slightly as well. Uh, but the, the key component is getting a sidewalk um, 
period. Right. Um, uh, but in situate in other communities, we try to have what we call a context-sensitive solution, which is looking at it for every specific project for what would fit in the context of that neighborhood. It just you, I <clears throat> made me think of a question when you were talking. How long of a process? I mean, I I think you can hear us, you know, thoughts and yes. you know, it's a wonderful idea. How would the neighbors could they expect to see something? fall of 2010 spring of 2011 what, what would be your best guess um because we have federal funding we have to go through a thorough process for the preparation of the plans through MassDOT as well as the right-of-way process and we would look to have a warrant article on for the fall town meeting if you have one that allows this board in order to receive the property or take property if necessary which we hope wouldn't be necessary um, in order to make the project go towards construction. Um, we've identified with staff and with the um, um, stakeholders that uh, from a realistic perspective, given the time period for design review, right of way, and the next winter, uh, it's likely that construction wouldn't start until spring of 2011. John, any comments? Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you, Mr. DeAndre and Mr. Cope. I know you've mm -hmm. been uh, working and um, uh, with the report. Um, <clears throat> I know uh, Representative Camwell has worked very diligently and hard, um, but also uh, Principal Fitz Moritz and, and Barbara Leiden has have been very active in trying to um, focus the attention on the area that's of need. And um, so I commend them all. And uh, obviously, the next question was the sooner the better. And I know uh, the spring of 2011 mm -hmm. is kind of the targeted date, but obviously the sooner. It would be nice, but uh, it's a great plan. I wholeheartedly endorse it. <coughs> you know, the bottom line here is, is safety. Sidewalks are something that's very limited in our town. Uh, it's a great opportunity when we're able to get funding from the feds or fed, from the federal government for it, uh, certainly in these times, but also um, it's, an, it's an absolute necess uh, necessity um, to be able to get people, not just children, but just pedestrians, to be able to go and walk. And um, so I, I wholeheartedly uh, support it. Thank you. I think we probably know the answer to this, but before you leave, uh, maybe you could uh, explain how Situ was chosen for this, uh, how, who went about getting this project, and, and uh, how it happened. Why Situ? Yeah, all why the situate? cities and towns <laughs> in the country, <laughs> and all the cities and towns in the country. Right. Right. Well, it is all in the, the gin joints. No, in I the don't world. think they stuck, a, they stuck a pin on a map. I think there was more to that than. Right. than well, that's a very good question. Uh, the answer is it's not only situate. Um, we have uh, over 270 cities and towns across the Commonwealth who have signed up as partners mm -hmm. in the Safe Routes to School program and are actively conducting programs to, you know, hold events and educate the kids about safety and uh, so forth. Um, after communities are doing that for a, at least a year, they are eligible to submit to us a request for an assessment of the infrastructure. The result of that, if they're selected, is the report that you see. Um, we've got uh, over 30 communities involved in that right now in, in various stages of, uh, of development and review and acceptance of, of the as assessment reports. And um, so that, that's how it happened. So the, the folks at, at the Hatherley School, um, you know, picked up on the Safe Routes to School program. Um, they've been very active in, in um, holding events and, and getting the kids enthusiastic and they submitted a request for the assessment and um, so then when we received those uh -huh. um, we kind of turned to our consultants and said um, see what you can see what you can do in uh, looking at the conditions in the in the neighborhood in the community um, what are the problems what are the what are the hazards what can be done and so the results come out in the um, in the assessment report. If the community, if, well, then we engage in this process. Yep. You know, a discussion, a conversation about, um, you know, is the assessment report correct? Are the are the recommend? Do the recommendations make sense? Do they seem appropriate? And so forth. And we get into that kind of dialogue, 
and um, in in the case of Situate, you know, there, there there's been some um, some adjustment, um, as Kevin was indicating, and um, you know we're happy about that. Um, we want to have projects that fit the community, and you folks know a lot better than we do what fits. So um, from here on, um, once once we get your concurrence, um, then the proce process shifts into um, kind of the early stages of, of design. Uh, land sur surveyors are hired. That should be happening uh, very soon. Um, that's the basis for, for the, the designs that the engineers come up with. There will be further discussions. There will be reviews by um, uh, state engineers. There will be reviews by, um, by Kevin. Um, and there will be a public hearing at the 25% stage. Um, so it's a process. And uh, the process is pretty well defined by the federal government. But since the bulk of our transportation funding comes from the federal government, that's the process we use. And uh, if, if anybody wants more information about that, I can, I can give you more. <laughs> I think you are. You're very but, uh, thorough. Yeah. But that's, that's why. Um, Situate was one of, of 35 communities that submitted, that, that had been in the program for at least a year mm -hmm. and submitted a request. Um, and uh, we're, we're going to be doing another round, uh, we expect, uh, this spring, uh, seeking additional communities. Now, we're only, um, we're, we're just doing one school per community because it's, it's limited funds and we want to spread the benefit. But um, if Congress, um, you know, comes forward with a lot more money, we could change that policy. But we think that's, that's a reasonable one, at least for the time being. Thank you. We can uh, we can assure you uh, of the sincerity uh, of our safe to, uh, Rooster Schools group and the enthusiasm they've been keeping this in front of us for, for a couple of years. <laughs> I'll bet. And uh, they have. And, and it's, it looks like it's paying off. So we th we yep. thank not only you but we also thank them, uh, Barbara and, and all, for, for all you've done and and, and keeping this this issue active and now seeing it come to some sort of fruit. Uh, Representative <coughs> Jim Cantwell has been patient in the background, so I'll just. Mr. Chairman, I just, you, you had asked about how a situ would pick, and, and Jim gave a very long, elaborate, uh, detailed answer. I, I, my answer is just two words. It's Barbara Leiden. <laughs> when, when Kevin and Al, we had a meeting with the regional director for Mass Highway, and Al Baggert, when we were talking about the priorities here, and by the way, when we get to it to talk about seawalls and the like, I want to put accolades for the work that Kevin and Al both do. But uh, Barbara's name came up several times about the person leading this effort and, and thrilled to be able to help in my small way. But uh, we're excited to see this project moving along and, and, and know with the uh, presentation tonight with the boards, with the boards help that uh, hopefully there will be construction in the spring of next year at the latest. So let's vote. <laughs> <laughs> before, we, uh, let's, before, we, before we do, I just want to remind people of something that uh, the gentleman said here, that there will be public hearings. Um, this is not the final design that you're going to see. Um, as Mr. Bangert's pointed out to us, we, the situation has got a long distinguished history of making sure we have public hearings, usually in the basement of the library where neighbors will be notified and, and people's input will be solicited and welcomed and incorporated as much as possible. So we're just really kicking this off. Don't anybody think that the pavers are showing up next week um, or anything like that. But uh, we're delighted to be able to, to work with you folks and thank you so much um, if, for uh, that. Just one quick question, but, but our vote is the acceptance of the process, right? So the pavers will be coming at some point once we correct, but they're not once we vote. Right, they're not coming next week. Right, there's no design. Do you, I so think, do you, uh, do you I think our, uh, uh, there's no motion really necessary, but I think would like to certainly give a consensus if, if not a motion. Actually, it would, and I think it would be to support the the the, the idea, the concept, the the project. Uh, so I'll entertain if, if anyone wants sure. to make I'll a move, motion. I'll move that the uh, board endorse and support um, safe routes to school on Hollett Street as proposed this evening uh, by Mr. Cope and Mr. DeAndre. Second. 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 Sure. Further discussion from the board? From the floor? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Go for it. Thank you, John. Thank you, very Thank you everybody. Thank you. Good work. Well done. Uh, the next item is walk-in.
Again, Representative Thanks, Cantwell is here and wasn't really scheduled for walk-in, but we asked Jim in light of all the the uh, newspaper reports and stories around about the governor's budget, level funding, uh, level funding education. We asked Jim to give us a, a brief synopsis of what a that actually means. So, Jim, if you would. Thank you for having me. Mr. Thank Chairman, you for, thank you for having me. In responding to uh, Selectman Vignani, when Tony had emailed last week, as thank soon you. as the, the State of the State speech that we all w watch with great interest, when the Governor had set as a goal to be able to uh, level fund local aid and to level fund education aid. And uh, I know the questions came immediately to uh, my office, uh, just saying, is that to be possible? And I, while I wanted to stress that as a former Selectman myself, as a, a parent who has a child in elementary school, as a, my mom was a teacher, certainly a very strong proponent for public education, I was counseling what you already are doing, which is, is to be very cautious and uh, to be very uh, careful in your uh, <coughs> deliberations for several reasons. The, the governor is setting as a goal to level fund Chapter 70 in local aid. However, in, in doing that, he's making some assumptions. Uh, one, he's assuming a minimum of $600 million to come in, in federal funding. Uh, indeed, actually, I believe it's the exact amount, amount of $750 million to c that would be coming that will require another federal vote. It would have to be an appropriation. That's an unknown. The governor in his budget is, is estimating that would have uh, growth of in excess of 3 percent revenue. Uh, there was a uh, consensus revenue hearing that I went to just a month ago where there's some disagreement about what the actual number of revenue growth will be. Uh, the governor's proposal is to use some one-time funds. Indeed, we have a, a stabilization account that when I came into office, we had over $2.5 billion in our stabilization account. It now is less than $600 million. We've used an incredible amount just to be able to, to plug the holes in, in the state budget, where last year we had a $5 billion federal deficit. This year, because of a structural deficit, we're still going to be addressing a $3 billion deficit at the state level. Uh, so that's a third part that the governor is relying upon. And, and the final one was discussion of some new taxes on sugar, candy, soda, water, juice, and the like. And, and my sense is that there really is not an appetite for those, and, and that's some 50 to $75 million. So the governor had uh, objectives. Certainly we all share those goals to try to hold Chapter 78 harmless, to, to not have cuts to local aid. But I still think the pragmatic way to go forward is to, as you're developing a budget, to say let's look at our worst case scenario, a worst case being a 10 percent reduction, somewhere maybe a 5 percent reduction, plan accordingly. And as we're having revenue numbers that come forward, we'll, uh, I am an advocate and will be speaking in favor of our giving you a number that you can rely upon before town meeting so that we can have uh, a, a definite local aid number that will be the bottom line of what you can depend upon. Uh, and then if additional revenues come in, we'd get that information to you as soon as possible. But I, I very much wanted to come, and I appreciate, Mr. Chairman, you taking the time, because when things get out there in the paper, it puts expectations on you saying that, that, that you indeed are going to have these funds and that you would not be uh, making any kind of reductions. And I'd note, even if we level funded, that still is a cut uh, because you've had uh, items that, that go just by inflation. So Thank I appreciate you. the time. I'd be happy to take any uh, questions. Without, without prolonging it, I just, I guess to summarize, it would be safe to say that this whole process is still a, a work in project, that's progress. A, that's in, exactly in right. And, and you know from the yep. 28 years of being. Some odd, <laughs> some odd years. <laughs> that, uh, that it, it's the, the governor makes his proposals and, and there's some great goals and we hope that we can achieve them and then our budget just after April vacation will have the house budget that will be able to refine better what revenues are coming in the Senate's always in the best position because as it gets closer to our July uh, time that we'll do the budget they'll have the best numbers but I appreciate how and I hear all the time from each of you individually I appreciate the follow-up and, and appreciate the, the 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 good questions so that I can do the best job and be able to get that information back Thanks, Jim. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just, just a comments. Just a quick comment, just so everyone watching knows that that the financial forecast and many, as well as Trisha, have uh, moved that in that direction. Our budgets are do reflect a decrease in state aid, um, and those are the numbers that we're moving forward with. We do get questioned all the time, particularly at school meetings now, right. about utilizing that money. Um, the problem is the timing of it. You know, where our town meeting is. Uh, um, April 12th, right. I think, and right. and you don't even have your budget back by then, and every one of those dollars is jobs. So um, 
you know, the quicker that we can get it. I understand. Um, and the more money that we can get is more teachers and policemen and everything else that we're going to be able to save and keep in our budget. So. And, and for people watching, it is one of the frustrations always from, from when I was a selectman. We'd want to have numbers to rely upon. And because our, our you're doing the budget, you have town meeting in April. Uh, the state budget's not done till July. The federal budget's not till October. Typically, so it, it, it is difficult to match these things up. The best thing, that the, the, the thing that's most fair for us to do is to do a local aid resolution before town meeting so you know what you can depend upon. And Trisha, I, I know you're seeing every time I'm in, just for our, our popping in to try to compare notes uh, and hearing from your many friends at the State House, uh, Rep. Skybeck, I was with earlier today. But, but when we're looking for people watching, just knowing that the major things that the state relies on for income, income tax collections, we had a decrease of 15.2 percent back just in, in 2010. Sales tax were down 5.5 percent, even with an increase that we had. Uh, the lottery was down, um, the exact number I don't have before me, but I know Tim Cahill said the lottery was off, which we rely upon greatly for our local aid. That's gonna Corporate go up, and business though. taxes were down 17.6%. Excise tax collections were down 55.7%. So these are things that we're dealing with <coughs> at the state level, and it makes it difficult to maintain the commitment that, that we want to have. The only, the, the sole good news that was coming out uh, is that we do anticipate from the four major groups that come before us and, and do estimates of where the economy is going is that uh, the Federal Reserve being the leaders, saying that they think that the, the economy hit rock bottom at the end of last year, September, October actually, and that the revenue forecasts are that we'll have a modest increase for this year uh, and that we'll be starting to, to bring some jobs back. It still is modest, uh, but th there is the ray of hope in that we know it'll be a very difficult uh, budget cycle again this year, but that uh, w the, the light is at the end of the tunnel is the hope. Well, Jim, the only thing I'd just to finish is Please. Um, the um, you know, the, the, the number, you know, we would like your support in terms of getting the money in local aid. Obviously, it was down 10 percent last year. Right. You know, we keep dealing with negative, negative numbers and with every other impact on the budget going in the same direction, it's really going to affect the services that the towns be able to provide to um, the citizens, the students, and everything else. So we're hoping that you and Bob and Garrett all give their support to get local aid as high as it can and get it back to the numbers that that we expected to and, and I spoke to both uh, today just saying that we'll formally come before you whenever it fits for your for your schedule and that that is the commitment you'd have for me yeah. about doing everything we can to maximize local aid because that is what people most identify with it, it's uh, all the local services that that we know is it's a priority you're at the front lines of providing services I get it, it it's uh, the difficult part is we, we we're trying to, to balance saying we don't want to use up all of our stabilization account <coughs> because we still last year with a five billion dollar deficit we were still able to keep with moving we kept a terrific bond rating because we, we showed a balance. You know, $2 billion in cuts, $2 billion of using some of our one-time revenue sources, and then uh, new revenue sources, the, the, the sales tax. And that they were, we were given high marks for that. We have to mind that again this year to be very careful about where our spending is. And I will tell you, and you'll see things I'll send at another time, but just to prioritize how we're doing things to be more efficient at the state level to make sure that, that you can best do your job here locally. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else? I just want to thank you, uh, Jim. Uh, several of us were at the school committee budget hearing uh, Saturday morning at, at 8 in the morning, and, right. and Bill Johnston said probably five different times how much he appreciated your responsiveness of you personally and your office when he's calling you up and trying to find out what the latest numbers are and everything. So I really appreciate your communication. No, and, and I appreciate and his kind all. words. I'm actually going to see him in a few minutes. I, he's doing the PTO presentation at Hatherley, which yeah. will, will be going next. But so I just want to say thanks. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Jim. You. Thank you very much. Uh, next item on the agenda is the discussion and a vote for Habitat for Humanity, Affordable Housing Trust, Rich Lane, and John Allen. <coughs> Gentlemen. How you doing? For this Thank you. Uh, we got this. It's fine with me. Everybody got a piece that shows more. I think we in. have. Same thing? Yeah, I think it's. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah, this is good. This is a Thanks, continuation of a discussion that uh, we've had a few months ago uh, regarding a partnership, I guess a three way partnership by May of the Town, uh, the uh, Situate uh, Affordable Housing, and Habitat for Humanity. Uh, to build uh, affordable homes 
on Stockbridge Road on a piece of land owned by the town on Stockbridge Road. So do you gentlemen would just introduce yourself for the record and it's all yours. Hi. I'm Rich Lane, 93 Lawson Terrace, situate resident for about 38 years now. John Helen, 40 R Beaverdam Road, <laughs> situate resident. And uh, chairman of the Affordable Housing Committee. All yours. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> this parcel of land is uh, on Stockbridge Road we're proposing or asking that the selectmen declare it surplus and then sponsor an article on the floor of town meeting for the spring that would put the property up to Habitat and the housing partnership so that we'd be allowed to build three three-bedroom single-family homes uh, in the affordable category and that's about it yeah, other than I would ask that it, with the selectmen sponsoring their article that the habitat houses wind up being given first priority to situate residents before it opens up to the other 28 South Shore habitat towns, which was the same thing we did when we built the one next to the police station. Uh, at that particular time, there were about 18 other families that met almost all the criteria to be a recipient from situate alone. And I can't imagine in the past three years that it's gotten any better. Uh, I think the number might be even more so. So <coughs> that's what we're proposing. We're asking for you to declare it surplus and sponsor an article for the floor of town meeting in the spring and put it before the people that care enough to go out that day and vote uh, and get on with the process and see if we can't put three houses on this property. Just one question before we end up with the board, but while I think of it. Uh, is there any particular order uh, that these be built, or would they all be built at the same time? There'd probably be uh, uh, the Affordable Housing Trust has money in hand, so yeah. they might be one of the starting people there. Uh, usually Habitat will start to raise money, or has started to raise money, but as the, as the land gets given to them, then they're able to start their campaign. Uh -huh. So my right. funds come in as they, as they move along. Uh, so that, that could be an area uh, that we help out in. Um, Again, as we proceed with this, to, to get the current test for the septic uh, and those type of things. Uh, so more than likely, affordable housing trust there. And our house would be for a situate resident as well. Thank you. From the board. John. I just, <coughs> just ha I've had quite a few conversations with Rich. He stopped by my office a couple different times. Just happened to notice right now, I went by the other day, and you know it's pretty hot. It's very thick, and it's hard to see just how much land's involved. But just now noticing that... Uh, each home is going to be a, an acre or more, or, you know, slightly under, but... By but zoning on Stockford Road, <laughs> you could actually put nine houses on this parcel of land, Sean. And I think that's, and, and, and that's what you said, and I think this is, you know, a nice fit for the neighborhood. Um, I know. Any idea what size homes will they be? Three-bedroom capes, something similar to what's out Yes, uh, probably a, again three bedroom case. The um, if the the third home that we're, we're working with uh, homes for our troops, uh, that might be determined uh, depending on the eligible person in there. That generally might be a one story uh, uh, building that they use right. again uh, for yeah, handicap yeah. accessible. Right. Great. Uh, Have you done perks already? No, not yet. We're waiting to kind of get this process done. I mean, it's homes on either side, so I, unless it's a we have a pretty good idea and, and kind of, we did delineate the wetlands in there yeah. and up there, but we have a pretty good idea that we'll be able to put, uh, you know, not the exact location, but we'll be able to get the septics in there. We have a main going down that road now, don't we? We do. I'm and not sure whether it's a forced well, main or not, though. I don't know whether it ends near Beers' Lane or we'd have to get confirmation on that. Form A's, John? Would these be four bays? Yes. Okay. John Denny? Yeah, I, I, obviously, I, I wholeheartedly support this. I'm using wholeheartedly a lot tonight. But I mean, the reality is, <laughs> you know, at a minimum, this is a very unintrusive uh, application for three single family homes of, you know, nice size, nothing over the top, nothing blown out of proportion. Um, both the Affordable Housing Trust as well as the um, uh, Habitat for Humanity. I mean, as you heard from Mr. Lane, we could actually probably render more um, uh, affordable homes out of it. I think at a minimum, this property should yield at least two. And in the event that uh, homes for our troops are unable to, then I think we should either have it uh, available for either another affordable house 
either through the trust or through the uh, Habitat for Humanity. And, um, you know, um, this is more than double the zoning. It's set back off the road. Um, and I can tell you as a, as a trustee of the Affordable Housing Trust, whatever the trust builds, uh, it, it will be a um, showpiece for all affordable <coughs> homes through the trust. So, um, you know, for as far as the aesthetics and the, um, the build out, um, it'll be a very nice building. And I think it's something that everybody in town will be proud of. Not that the Habitat Humanity isn't, it is, but I'm just saying from a, as a trustee, it, it will be a very nice building. So I hope, uh, you know, I, I, I encourage my fellow board members to endorse it. Uh, I, I ask that you do declare it surplus land so that we can take it to town meeting and that we're able to get it on the, uh, the warrant for this upcoming um, uh, town uh, meeting and um, get started so we can get these, these buildings in the ground. Uh, I completely think this is great for all the reasons these guys just said. Thank you very much. My one question is just a procedural question. If we declare it surplus, can can we declare it surplus, or does town meeting have to declare it surplus? And if, say, it passes surplus, or we declare it surplus, but then town meeting doesn't pass anything else, what happens to the land then? Have we have we taken it out of our control somehow without being able to to do this? That's my only procedural I think, thing. I, mean, yeah. I think we can declare it surplus, uh, and we have to check with town council for this project. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we can and make it great. For some reason, it could not happen. Go forward. That doesn't. That doesn't yeah, mean that you don't have a, the asset. Right, perfect. So, you know, and like I said, the main thing, this is this is great. Let's just go for it. That's it. Tony, can just a quick question. There's three houses here. Yes. Who, of Habitat's doing one, the Trust is doing two? Uh, the trust is going to do one, and we're looking to have homes for our troops. Okay, uh, and if they don't want to do it, then right. perhaps the authority would? Yes. Okay. Um, and the abutters, have we spoken with the abutters? Okay. Are they both? on board with the project? My conversation with Billy Lopes, who is 171 yep. right there, would, when you get started, let me know. I'll bring a hammer and a saw. Good. And how about Ms. McCray? No, I've not spoken no, this time. No response. I've called her a couple of times and got no. OK, I, it would probably make sense to get her yeah, We did be, well. uh, we were in touch with her uh, a couple of years ago on this project. and. Uh, they were in favor of it then. She was. Uh, but we haven't had contact this, this time around. Great. And the cost, I, I, I know we don't know the exact cost, but how, what, John, what is there, about a million? There's a million five in the trust. A million five right in now. the trust. Um, that should do it. And so to build a couple houses or? <laughs> at least to build one. I well, think well, one. do it. But I mean, <laughs> but you I'm, said showpiece, Mr. Denny. It's, uh, <laughs> it's going to be done uh, very efficiently. Well, some of the, the some of the again, Habitat is raising their own funds uh, right. for their. Right. The, when they the came last year, I think, don't they take the proceeds from the one that they sold and kind of throw that back into the system? The other well, one? Sort of. Yeah. The house over here. Chris Sacciatella wound up with a $140,000 mortgage. The money he pays in goes to the bank. That it's mm -hmm. his until in in, he wants to get out of it. And he can get 8% on what he's paid if he chooses to leave the house. But the house always stays affordable through the Habitat right. program. The same thing would happen with this. But once they're built and up, they pay property taxes like everybody else, and right. there's a return to the town on the land once the house is done. Yeah. Right. And again, the homes for our troops house, they're fully funded to it, that we wouldn't be paying their way. They're, uh, they build their own house and uh, take everything from the ground right. up. Well, I think it's a great idea. I mean, I just would want to make sure that the other abutter wasn't completely opposed to it, and then I give it a thumbs up. I, well, maybe, I mean, I can speak to that when, when it came before the town meeting some time ago, you know, Bill Lopes had concerns, and I've, I think I've spoken to him since then. Richie certainly has, and uh, Susan McCray on the other side. I don't think she spoke at all the last time. So, and, and I agree with you, Tony. I know what you're saying, and that was a we just concern of mine. We didn't get a hold of it. I know when we spoke with them a couple of years ago. Right. They were like, right. Yeah, fine. Right. For the board, thank you. Uh, just, just to, uh, uh, before we make the motion, I just want to, to recognize the two members of Habitat for Humanity, Chris Don and Jerry from the executive director and uh, here in support, I am sure, 
of this project, so I just wanted to take the time to thank you for coming, and now we'll take that motion. Sure. Move that the Board of Selectmen vote to declare the property uh, located between 157 Stockbridge and 171 Stockbridge uh, be declared as surplus property in an effort to um, place it on the upcoming um, town meeting um, as an article for both Habitat for Humanity and the Affordable Housing Trust. Second. Um, oh, with the caveat that the Affordable Housing Trust have the first priority to uh, situate a resident um, in the event that it's built and that it is then um, placed into a lottery for, um, for sale. Did you catch that, Kim? <laughs> <laughs> someone <laughs> someone <laughs> second, no. someone second, second that quick. Second quick, <laughs> second that quick, somebody. Is it a second? Do I have yeah, a second? I second it. Yeah. All in favor? Uh, <coughs> opposed? Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks gentlemen. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, next item, Kevin is here. Kevin is here again. Kevin, come up if you would. Thank you. This is, a, this is a, uh, an item that's been on and off before us for the past couple of months. It's got to do with federal funding for seawalls, uh, seawalls that were damaged in the storm of 2007, I believe it was. Correct. Kevin, go ahead. Correct. Basically, um, we had some problem with the funding when the jobs came out. We've gone back to FEMA and gone over some of the values in the, in the percentage that the town is um, applying for. We've got them to adjust on some of the percentages uh, to go in the town's favor to give us additional money. And um, we also have, um, we're going to be getting a grant from the DCR for $50,000 to continue to allow us to have the money to uh, <coughs> the project in its entirety. The way it was set up when the project went out, there were five options, um, a base bid and five other bids of different areas of town. So we were in a position where we might have to not do one section or another in town. By the adjusting with the FEMA money in the DCR grant, looks like we're going to be able to do it all. So that's what the request is for tonight to um, award this contract to FSM Lynch, who was the low bidder in the project. And there were two bidders on the project. Um, the other one was Mass Building and Bridge, which um, <coughs> came in $138,990 higher. And we've done use lunch in the past. Correct. Questions from the board? Could you just Briefly, so people are watching in the press and so on, not in detail, but, but which which revetments we're talking about here? Um, this covers the Glades area, Gla off Glades Road, First Cliff, Minot Beach, Second Cliff, and Third Cliff, as well as in the base bid sections of Humrock, and um, a couple other smaller sections in town. That's great. Soup to nuts, south to north. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a it's a federally funded project, and it, it's a lot of money, but a lot of the money's in movement because they're only doing certain sections of the wall. Mm -hmm. It would be nicer if we could do, say, a quarter-mile stretch of wall and just replace it all in place. But we might be doing a 50-foot section here, pick everything up, move down, yeah. and, and do, a, do another 100-foot <coughs> section and jump around all over, all over town. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, the match is fantastic for us from, from the feds. So. Right. And when would this begin, if this is awarded and all this, roughly? Um, we're going we're gonna to try and get it going as soon as we can. Um, we don't want to be doing the work in the summer, obviously, and, and that's what we're starting to, starting to get up against. Starting to get yeah. up against now. Great. Thank you, Kevin. And just, just to reiterate, this, there's been a lot of talk about seawalls lately, mm -hmm. and this is just federal money that's going specifically to the storm damage from the storm of... Right. This was this was the original project that we had to go back to town meeting to request right. an additional yeah. hundred and twenty thousand dollars for because the state bailed on their portion that they were going to put up right. the twelve and a half percent. But it has nothing to do with the other damages that the no. town has to deal with, and the town gets a seventy five percent. Seventy five percent. So the town pays twenty five percent. And actually, the way it's it's worked out with FEMA, um, it's actually going to work out a little better because they're going to cover some of our costs for oversight. Um, for a time when we have an engineer out there watching the project to make sure they're doing the correct areas and tracking the units, they're actually going to pick up uh, some of that time, which is, which they normally don't do, and they're also picking up some of the engineering costs, which okay. is which is a plus for us. Thank you, gentlemen. Anything else, Just, uh, Kevin? Since um, 2007, have there been any, any other areas that have been qualified for damage or for funding through FEMA? 
No. So I'm, I'm just saying since the other storms that we've had. I know you're, we're hearing um, a lot in Sand Hills, but I was just curious. Nothing really, no. John, I think of this amount of money, how we're going to get reimbursed 73 quarters of 972. Is that correct? Are you a little concerned there were only two bidders, Kevin? With what? That there were only two bidders. Um, I mean, in the past, we've had more. In, in the past, we've had more. One of the things that we require on our equipment is that, that it's used with a crane, um, that a mm -hmm. crane's used in that area, or a lattice boom type crane mm -hmm. on the beach. Um, one of the things we are going to look into in the future is using maybe hydraulic excavators. Um, but that can be pro problematic also if you're using a hydraulic excavator um, on the water. The, the job doesn't come out as well, but sometimes it can be a little cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, this has been the town's past practice, but with two bids it becomes legal. Even if there was only right. one bid, it would still be, it'd be legal right. for, uh, for the Attorney General. No, and I, I'm familiar with the name. Like Joe had said earlier, that's a, they've done a lot of work for us. That's for sure. And he's but. just finishing up a job, I guess, in Marshfield. All right. So... Further discussion? Uh, no motion. A motion, please. Move the Board of Selectmen vote to award the contract for the revetment repair project, contract number 09FS01 to SM Lynch Corporation of East Weymouth, Massachusetts, for a total bid price of $972,990, with payment to be made at the unit prices and or lump sum prices pending receipt of a certificate of insurance, 100% performance, and 100% labor and materials bond. Second. Motion to be made and seconded. Further discussion from the Board? Uh, from the floor, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Kevin, before you leave, the Seawall Committee, have we started, have we called any meetings? Uh? Um, actually, I was going to call a meeting, but um, it, the night I was going to call a meeting, it turns out the Street Acceptance Committee is on that same night, so um, I'm in the process. I'm, I'm going to alter that to um, two weeks from that. I don't have the exact date, but calls will go out to people. Thank you. For that area. We are going to couple of calls from people. What, what was happening, so I said. I started talking to a couple of people, and then I got the email from yep. you about the street acceptance committee, and, and they were overlapping, so I was going to just push it off. Thank you. Jim? Jim, I may say one thing as I'm heading out to it, because uh, both Al and Kevin wouldn't say it uh, themselves, but it's just talking to Kevin Mooney tonight, who actually gives his cell phone. He works at the Division of Conservation Resources. But he, he was saying, well, what a tremendous asset we have for our DPW, and, and that just in the last couple of weeks, we, there was one grant for $51,000, through the DPW for mm -hmm. solar lighting. This $50,000 from the FEMA grant, another grant coming, $50,000, just in the last few weeks. It, it, these guys make my job very easy. Yep. We follow them and think they're already being done. We just want to give the accolades because we're hearing from state agencies uh, how they appreciate this, the professionalism of our offices here. Thank you for bringing that to it's our great. attention and to everyone's attention. Thank you. Well, we're in. Thank you. Uh, we are now going into the budget. The first budget we're going to hear, I guess, article, really, the social, uh, regional school, social vote tech. Is there someone here from social vote tech? Can I talk? No, I think. No, no, I think that's that's postponed. That's postponed. Yeah, that's All right. Postponed that that makes it easier. Beautification. Joe, one second. Sean, yep. Yeah, beautification. I think they're outside. Yes, they're coming in. We just... 650. And what, and what we're going to do, Donna, good, good evening. What we will be doing is uh, similar to all the other budgets we've heard so far, and that is that we would like to, to hear the budget, listen to the presentation by the chairman, and, and we will not be voting on it tonight. But, Donna, if you would start by giving, giving us a, uh, if everyone's on board, I think, if everyone has their budget, just a, a, a mission statement to what what you do, I guess, so, okay. and we'll go from there. Well, I'd like to introduce the ladies that are here with me Thank tonight. Thank you. I'm Joy Farrell, Senator. I'm Janet D'Angelo, Public Relations. Uh, Leslie Dynell, just Thank you. board member. And uh, we are the Beautification Commission, part of it. Um, to en our mission is to enhance the beauty of Situate through planting and maintaining selected public spaces using community resources. And by community resources, we're refer referring not only to the funds that we're here to discuss tonight, but also to the residents who volunteer their time and expertise 
to create the little gardens at intersections and entrances to public buildings. Currently, we have 33 Adopt-A-Lot units, and every one is assigned to a caretaker. That means we have about 35 caretakers of record, but we know that many others get involved in the upkeep of these <coughs> Adopt-A-Lots. Kids, husbands, friends, neighbors are all involved, especially when it becomes necessary to water during the hot spells. This means that many residents are interested in carrying out the mission of the Beautification Commission, and further that beautification funds are an extremely good value for money. So for this reason, we respectfully request the Board of Selectmen appropriate the full amount of our fiscal year budget of $16,020. Thank you. I, I, I'll just start off by saying, and I, I guess I say this every year, and I have for many years, that uh, and we can't thank you enough for all you do. I mean, it's, you know, there was it's an overworked statement. You know, people are unrecognized of what they do, but but you know, you as individuals, I think, are unrecognized. But your work certainly isn't because of those. Would you say 35 plots? Of, you know, they, they just wouldn't be done if, if it wasn't for this group. And <coughs> if you can just picture the the islands near the uh, the Greenbush line, the islands all over town. Picture what they would look like if, if they weren't taken care of, if they weren't uh, flowers and, 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 and kept up to the degree they are. They'd be, they'd be an like, eyesore. They'd look like the rotary in Greenbush. They'd look like the rotary. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yep. Absolutely. And, and so we thank you. We can't thank you enough for the work you do, you, you do and continue to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, open up to the board. Any questions on either anything they do or the budget itself? I, I the, just um, from looking at what you do with what little you have, it, it's tremendous to the town, and the increase makes perfect sense. And I, I, I support it. I mean, I there may be a discrepancy, but I'm like with the town administrator. But I'm like, the difference is so minimal. Well, or I de just minimus want to point that out I'm, that it's not an increase over the current year budget; it's actually less. And I, I just think it's de minimis to the extent that what you do, it's that's where. You know, it makes sense for the town to be spending that type of money. It's it's nice. Thank you. Keeping in mind, we won't be voting tonight. I understand. Right, right. I just want to say thank you. Like, you know, thank, thank you very much. I should be so. saying you're welcome. <laughs> Tony, just a, a quick uh, point: is that the uh, the request was for sixteen thousand twenty dollars, and the town administrator put in fifteen thousand dollars, and obviously there's cuts in every budget, and it's difficult to do. But I think. Uh, um, um, you know, hopefully you can make do with, with the amount that, that's available to you. The budget is one of the smaller budgets in the town, but I tell you, if you put the labor hours in at minimum wage for all the people that, that are involved in it, it would be one of the higher budgets. So we really do appreciate all the man hours that, I mean, how many, there's 30 and or 40 women. people, and woman hours, yes, <clears throat> yeah. um, that go in, go into getting these things in the proper shape that they are. So we appreciate what you do and with the limited resources that we have for you. Thank you. I thank all. All the persons working with you folks. This is wonderful stuff. Thank you all. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, ladies. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next is historical. Dave, I believe. Good evening. How are you? Good evening. Again, we're asking everyone to start off just by reading the mission statement so people will get an idea, better idea, not just any question what the historical society does. But. Hey, I have, by the way, with me tonight Betty Meisner, who is the chairman of the Board of Trustees. Betty, welcome. Easy. <laughs> the mission statement. A municipality is judged in good part by how well its historical properties are maintained. Sidgwood has seven town-owned historical buildings. Cudworth House built in 1797, Sitchwood Lighthouse built in 1811, Mann Farmhouse built in 1825, Massachusetts Humane Boathouse built in 1896, Irish Moss Shed adjacent to the Boathouse built in 1900, Lawson Tower built in 1902, and the Lawson Gates built in 1902. Our mission is to maintain these important structures for future generations and provide educational opportunities at these properties. So if the public has a good understanding of the role these buildings played in the development and the history of the town. Thank so that's you. That's our mission statement. 
Thank you. And again, as we said to the prior group that came in, and it certainly holds for you, those buildings wouldn't be there, I'm afraid, if it was up to the town over the years to maintain them and fix them. They would have they would have fallen into disrepair. So we thank all of you and your predecessors and everybody for doing the work they've done. I, I, if I could start off with one question, and it probably um, goes right to the crux of this. There's a big discrepancy between your request and the town administrator's suggested request. Patricia, would you like to speak to that, or how should we work this? Who, want, who wants to? Well, I, I, can, I, can, I can give you kind of a quick rundown as yeah. to how this is playing out. Um, just as a reminder, uh, for the last fiscal year, uh, our request, not for the year coming up, but for the last fiscal year, uh, was $68,000. We had uh, several projects at some, of these, at some of these sites that needed to be done. Um, the town administrator uh, decided to take $62,000 from the historic uh, trust account, which is the MBTA train money, and funded 62000 of the $68,000 request that way. So the actual uh, amount affecting the budget last year was $6,000. Our request this year was $28,000, so $40,000 less. Uh, there, there were several projects, or th there are several projects that we're concerned about. Um, and we met with uh, Trish a couple of weeks ago. We, we're, we're fully aware of the, the budget issues that are facing the town. Uh, her request to you, I believe, will be $6,500, which will cover just the, um, the utilities at these buildings and the alarm systems. That would not include any repairs. There are a couple of repair issues that I do want to draw your attention to. One is um, a need at the Lawson Gates on Branch Street. Town, uh, and over the last several years, has spent a, a large amount of money repairing most sections of those gates. Uh, the total uh, that has been spent up to this point in time is $44,000. There are two small uh, stanchion, stanchions at each end of those, those gates that do need repair, and our estimate from the contractor for that was $10,000. So that was included in the $20,000 that we requested. Thank you. That doesn't get done this year. Uh, obviously, the cost will go up in future years. Our concern is, is that we are able to maintain these buildings. That's, that's critical. So if, some, if the town, for some reason, could find some more money other than the $6,500, that would be great. Um, that's kind of where we're at. Thank you. <clears throat> Trisha, a comment? Uh, did he cover it more or less? Yeah, I just, um, as Dave noted, he <coughs> went over Excuse in detail sure. all the projects and all Thank the you. improvements and the scheduled maintenance and capital that needs to be done. I do have some concerns about um, the window replacement in the lighthouse and some other things. Um, but given the financials this year, um, it isn't as much as I certainly would like or for other departments where I wish, you know, we had the revenues to distribute them. I want to extend my thanks to Dave for his understanding when I contacted him about the recommended budget. Um, and I think this is another one of the budgets like beautification where if our local aid comes in better or what, we'll have a list of priorities where, you know, we can add stuff back in. And I know there's at least one item in particular that's on my list for the Historical Society. Thank you. Uh, question for the board, comments, questions? Yeah, Dave, with the gates um, at Lawson, how, I guess what I'm curious is why wasn't that a part of the condominium association that was established for them to maintain? I mean, given the fact that there are a lot number, a larger number of um, unit owners there, I would think it would well, have been easier for them to within, uh, absolve that cost. Those within the town road layout. Bossy Lane is a town road. road so road. It, it falls in the town road layout, so it's it's not part of any private property. Those are the only remaining gates that Thomas Lawson put up, so <laughs> we would like to keep them preserved. 
Yeah. No, I was only asking because I'm like, there are a number of people there, and I'm just curious how the town came to it. But you're saying that they were put on town property to begin with by Mr. Lawson. I see. Thanks. Just another thank you. I mean, again, all these, the, the amount of work that you and your group put into it, particularly you, Dave, whenever I have a question or need to get something, you know, you go above and beyond to, to keep these um, buildings active, available to people, and in good good care. So kudos to you. You know, obviously we're in a difficult time, and the budget is what the budget is. Um, I do have a question, though, in terms of, have you gone to CPC for any of these stuff? Or do you have any articles in through them? Because... Obviously, that's been a major source of funds that we've been able to keep our historical buildings up to up to, you know, status. We we have a, a project uh, in front of CPC that they have voted on favorably. Um, I if if we can't get the Lawson Gates done this year through the regular budget, it's it's very likely that we would approach CPC for the next fiscal year. Uh, also, next year um, is going to be the 200th anniversary of the construction of the lighthouse, and there is a project out there that I have in mind. Uh, it's not huge, but uh, it should be done, and it should be done fairly soon. And that's uh, repairs to the utility room that's facing, kind of faces out toward the parking area. Um, I'd like to see that done. In the summer of 2011, we're going to be celebrating the 200th anniversary that fall. Uh, is, so the, is the project that you have before CPC, what's the dollar amount on that about? That is the, the purchase of the, the Bates House on Jericho Road. So that's that's the only request we have yeah. there for this year. you know what the dollar is on it? Uh, 350000 right. So it exceeds, obviously, the 10% requirement. Yes. Right. Thanks. We were, we were we were hoping that the the budget crunch wouldn't be apparently as bad as it is. We'll see. Rick, uh, yeah, just, no just a question and a comment. In your um, in your notice here information, you talked about the uh, you believe the historic trust account should not be used to fund part of this year's request. Um, is there still any money left in the MBTA? Historic? We have roughly. Mary Gallagher has the exact number, but it's it's roughly <coughs> six, sixty-two thousand. Okay, still left over. Okay. I, does I, does I, your point about does your point about saying not use this uh, still accurate if we were to assume that your we go with the town administrator's budget, not yours? Yes, and the okay. reason for that is this: if if the I just wanted to be very clear about yes, that. Yes, if, yep. if if the appropriation is in fact sixty five hundred dollars. Yes, we would be really concerned. <laughs> what our worry is is that something comes up. I mean, it's it's like your own house. You don't know when something's going to happen. You don't know when a roof is going to start to leak. And when that happens, um, you got to do something about it fairly quickly. Yeah. Um, so I would hate to see that last amount used for any of this okay because because of the the concern that we have for something happening and having to come to you guys and say look we need this we need that amount of money for yeah. a roof it whatever no, i understand i appreciate that and then the only comment i had one is that um you know, i'm pleased to see you folks again before us and uh working well with the historical commission you know there is a lot of discussion about that and some angst several years ago but this is this is all hand in hand and everything's working out very well i also wanted to remind people that uh i think it's three years ago now we changed the wording on this it says it now says appropriately historical <coughs> buildings where yeah. it used to say historical and people society, thought yeah. people thought that we were just funding the society right and i just want to remind people that this is not a fund we're not just funding the society that we're talking here about town owned historical mm -hmm. structures that the society maintains, maintains. Yes. and so we're you know entering um, we have understandings with them that they will oversee and maintain provided we provide the financial resources so we're not funding the private society here at all and that's why I remember Dave Betty and I we talked about this with Mr. Agnew about can we just change that so even in the um, uh, advisory committee booklet it now says historical buildings and that's really helped clear up some some confusion here so yeah. thank you thank you <coughs> thank you both for coming in
Thank you. All right. We, we, we share your hope that the money becomes available. We, we certainly do. Maybe it'll turn around and be a good year. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A lot, a lot of people yes. happy. Thank you, Betty. Uh, Council on Aging. What number is that? 541. 541. Good evening. Hi, how are you? If you wouldn't just mind introducing yourself for the record. I'm Florence Choate. I'm the director of uh, the Council on Aging, and I have three board members with me, uh, Joan Powers, um, and this is Pam Davis, who is the chairman of our board, and uh, Jerry Fiamonte. Um, I, do you want me to read the mission statement? Please, if you would. The purpose of the Situate Council on Aging is to identify needs and implement programs that will enhance the quality of life and independence of the seniors of Situate and to educate the community to the needs of its seniors. Thank you. And again, we, because without saying, we know <coughs> of all the good work that you're doing. Thank you. Start off this whole discussion by thanking you for it. The need is becoming larger, and you're, you're filling that need very nicely. Thank you very much. Comments from the board? Well, Florence, I didn't know if you wanted to just go through some of your accomplishments um, in terms of the usage. You know, all these numbers here are pretty impressive in terms of the usage of things and, um, you know, the trips that you make and increases. Um, Sorry to put you on the spot. That's all right. Um, well, as you can see, in our we certainly have grown, and uh, we have we're at the point now where we are running so many programs that uh, we can't take on any more. Um, we just fill the last slot that we have available. As you know, we can only run one program at a time, so it makes it difficult. But everything. Um, all of the, um, the work at the Senior Center has grown uh, exponentially over the last few years. Uh, the transportation, which is so important to the seniors of Situa, so many of them don't drive, and as you gentlemen know, seniors are living longer. So we have people who are in their 90s that rely on the van maybe two, three times a week, maybe more, for doctor's appointments, to go to lunches, uh, to, to go uh, get their groceries, um, and they wouldn't be able to do any of these things if the vans weren't running. We have been very fortunate in uh, the Council on Aging in having two vans given to us by um, SSA under Ann Burbank. Uh, so we have two new vans, and we're very fortunate because the state is not about to give us any vans in, in a in a short period of time, they've, they've just phased it out altogether. Uh, as I said, the outreach and advocacy, I don't think people understand that uh, the, the Council on Aging, I come as a social worker, so I, you know, I certainly, that's my, that's my biggest area of interest. But um, we are the only social service agency that Situate has. They don't have another one. Um, we end up doing protective orders for seniors. We go out and do home visits. Um, oftentimes, um, we're dealing with family members where they have a, uh, a senior member who is um, maybe um, dealing with Alzheimer's, dementia. We have some very good attorneys who have given their time so we can call them if the family's in crisis legally. Uh, there is just, every day, there is another um, crisis. We work with the police, we work with the fire department, they call on us, we call on them. Uh, there are a lot of seniors out there who are living alone and whose families are, no, are not um, around. And so they really rely on us more and more. And uh, so the work is, we have one full-time, uh, we have one part-time uh, outreach worker, and she works 25 hours a week. And because of the state grant, we have a part-time uh, outreach worker that's paid for out of, out of uh, state monies. So we have about, um, so we do, uh, we're continually busy. We do fuel assistance. This is for every 
member of Situate, the town of Situate. It's not just reserved for adults, I mean for seniors. Uh, families come in and they don't have money, they don't have oil in their tanks. We help them fill out the application, we process the application. If it's an emergency basis, we fax it. Um, oftentimes we, we are dealing with disabled. Um, sometimes we have we have members of the community whose family members may be disabled and they want to use our vans. We train them on the van, they can use the van after hours. Uh, the programs are not just for socialization. We do a lot of education. <coughs> this, um, the, a couple of months ago, we uh, started a survey for seniors 80 and over. We send out 779 surveys because there were that many seniors in situate uh, within that age group, asking them what kind of things they need, what information they needed, what things were the most important to, them, to us. And this is, I've done many surveys over my professional <coughs> life and I have never seen one as successful. We got 238 replies, which is phenomenal for, for a survey. And because of that, we were able to, we, had, we zeroed in in five areas that the seniors really wanted to know about. One was safety issues, and one was taxes, big thing on taxes, health uh, concerns, and um, wellness. So <coughs> we are going to do a panel um, and have um, uh, Jane, uh, Jane Lopato and uh, the fire department and uh, a social worker and uh, social elder service is going to be at that panel to address those questions that we had, that they have. So uh, we just did the um, MBTA Charlie card the other day. So we're constantly looking to educate, to provide resources. Um, we are in a, we're in a, seniors in a very, very difficult place right now. The state has cut back very badly on the seniors' services. Uh, there are uh, over 100 people on a waiting list not just from Situate, but the South Shore, at South Shore Elders for services. They don't have the money, they don't have the staff. So right now, uh, the people who are getting the priorities are people who are, are, are experiencing protective issues or frail elderly. Other than that, there are no services out there. So we do the best we can to find out the resources for them. Right. You guys do great, just great, great work, you know. And as you said, you reach out to more than the seniors in the town, and it's, um, you know, we wish you had more time and more space and more people to help, but uh, you do great with the resources that you get. Thank you. The, the only other thing I wanted to comment on the budget, Mr. Chairman, is the, uh, it looks like it actually went up, but that's because, and correct me if I'm wrong, that, that used to be, paratransit used to be a separate warrant, uh, article, so we've now combined it into... Yes. Yeah. So well, that, other, was, that was for billing purposes, right. really. But other departments may look and see that the number actually went up. It it, it went well, up because we, it was we, a we actually combination. Cut, um, and um, I mean, we would be happy to take what the town administrator has has decided. We know it's a bad year, and and you know we 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 did voluntarily cut about seventy five hundred dollars before when we presented our budget. Mm -hmm. So um, if. If the uh, if the board votes the amount that the town administrator recommends, we would be very very much appreciated. You're very, you're very close. I mean, it's a couple of thousand dollars, so yeah. we, we appreciate that attitude. Believe me, it's uh, not easy for you. I, I know to put together a budget and make these sacrifices, and mm -hmm. not easy for us sometimes. But well, we're all in it together. Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. And as Florence said, you know, demand just keeps rising. Yes. Yeah. Just programmatically, you know, I know with spatials, spatial, spatial issues, mm -hmm. you have a program going on, you can only do one at a time. And again, forgive me, I'm not the liaison, but using the GAR hall, is there a possibility to be able to use that during the day to be, it has the kitchen, has handicap or disability access, and, and if there's a program running at the uh, Council on Aging, is there a possibility to try to utilize that building when it's not being used at all? I, I was just thinking for I, a short time. I don't really know. I mean, we could look into it. The only thing I know is, is there's a heating issue there because we used it for the, in fact, we, we had a, um, an art show last year for the seniors, which was really very good. 
um, it was called Seniors Care, and it was all seniors who, who, who did the, the work, and they, it was incredible. And we did use the GAR hall. We're going to use the Senior Center this year because transporting the, the, um, the art, and you know, you could only be there that morning. It was difficult. It was just, uh, logistics were too difficult, so we will use the Senior Center. We're gonna have that in June. Um, I don't really know. I do know that, um, you know, we did we did make a donation because you know if, if we if they have to heat the building, so you know so I don't know what their stand would be uh, on that. I, I only reference it because yeah, I, during the day it's right. probably not being used. Mm -hmm. It's got to be heated yeah. anyways. But well, it's it obviously worth looking into. something to think yeah, about. That's all. Certainly. Thank you. Thank you. Further. Yeah, I'd just like to thank you all for coming here, <coughs> Florence. Um, since you've been on board in the last couple of years, it, the whole operation has really run very smoothly and professionally. I know that the um, number of phone calls that we've been getting has gone way, way down um, to basically non-existent. And uh, I just wanted, since you're all here, just to thank you for that because you got increasing demand and uh, it really turned the place around and, and we're all really really happy and, and very supportive and thankful for the, for what you've been doing for for the residents thank you That's it. thank you all thank, thank you. you thank you folks. uh next is recreation jennifer's out the hall i think there 6 30 is it <coughs> 6 30 it is good evening how are you good, how are you doing fine thank you and how are you good On how are you? How are you? Jennifer Hi, Bruce. If What we've been doing is starting off, as you probably know, by just introducing yourself for the record. And Jennifer, if, if you would just read the mission statement. Jennifer Vitelli with the Recreation Director, and Bruce Wade is the Chairman for the Recreation Commission. The mission of the Situate Recreation Department is to provide exceptional and creative programs, services, and facilities, such as beaches, fields, and playgrounds, that foster community spirit, involvement, while enhancing the quality of life for all people in situate and uh, I believe hopefully that we did that again last year I did pull together a brief year-end review <coughs> of the rec department and what we did last year in fiscal year uh, 09 we offered 313 classes all of which were self-supporting we had 32,412 attendances um, that would be each time a participant walks through the door that we're responsible for and that doesn't include any of the special events we offered 6,600 hours of programming time, which is on average 127 hours a week of programming. We employed summer 08, fiscal year 09, 116 seasonal employees. Again, all that were self-supported. And on top of that, we managed 145 volunteers and issued 235 field permits. And uh, that's done by myself and two part-time wonderful people <laughs> thank God for them um, so it was a busy year as far as the budget for fiscal year 11 um, all but the lifeguard services have been level funded and then the lifeguard services there is a 10% reduction which obviously is you know clearly very concerning for us um, when public safety is cut but we do understand the fiscal crisis that the town and the state are are in right now so with that said we've been I've been working on you know different scenarios on how we're going to manage that reduction and how what the impact will be i've you know met with the recreation commission with the lifeguard director and of course with the town administrator and um i'm sure we'll be back in front of you once that is figured out thank you for for uh, a point of, of of clarification i have a a relative family member who works for the recreation department and normally i would excuse myself from voting on a budget but we're not voting this evening so when we come time to vote i may very well excuse myself but i just wanted to make that public it makes two of us it makes two of us questions from the other three <laughs> <laughs> well i just say you know it seems like four four groups in a row that really overachieve with the resources that they're given and uh um you know, again, thank you for the hard work with all the people that you have there. You know, unfortunately, there's cuts in, in every department, and you have your challenges with the lifeguard stuff. Um, years ago, when we looked at it, you don't realize how expensive the lifeguards are. And um, obviously, you'll come up with some creative way, whether it's closing days or closing beaches or what have you. And um, we'll just make sure that we make sure that that is announced 
so that everybody's aware that whatever beats they're going to, whether it's guarded or not. Um, and as you said, the, the number of kids and the number of programs just continues to grow and grow. So um, I know you did get a little bit of uh, resources from from the fee that we assessed, and that really is just to, to do the scheduling of the, the yes. permit. So, um, and that really doesn't add up to a lot when you when you, th when you think about it. But, uh, um, you know, the challenges continue, and you guys do a great job. Thank you. Rick? The only thing I want to just repeat is you said 32,412? was your number. I just want everybody to make sure they understand the scale of this operation that they're running down, down in recreation. And it was only for the last, to be honest with you, the first couple of years of selectmen, I'm still kind of like, was still trying to learn what was going on. But I started dialing in about two years ago and I started realizing, whoa, the scale of what is going on down there is just immense. And uh, 32,412. With three, three people? Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. No, other than uh, was um, at some point, or is there will there be an increase maybe in sticker fees for for beaches or, or sets of consideration to think about? <laughs> <laughs> I'll defer uh, to the town administrator. Okay. Okay. <laughs> February sixteenth. Okay, right. fair enough. Can I, Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yeah. There were a couple of emails going back and forth, and I don't want to put Bruce or Jennifer on the spot. as hoping Paul might be a, about the Flannery Field. Could you you know maybe just give us a little update on that if. If, if it's all right with you, sure, if, fine, I mean, fine, it's a fine. new field that went online and with some drainage issues. No? No. Do you, you want, I mean, I, it was funny, Al was talking about that today. It's going to be addressed this spring. Yes. Okay. Um, they're going to do something to alleviate the fact that it puddles every time it rains. Okay. I mean, you folks probably know more, but it is going to be addressed. It will be coming offline again this spring. It will, yeah, to, to correct it. Right. That, that, that's all. If, Thank if I might. It's been fixed partway. It will be finished. Great. I've talked to Val about it too, just today. So it, it needs some more fix. Terrific. Great. But well, it's so scheduled. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, I want to, before I leave, just tell you, and, and I know you know, but remind you, I'm just sitting here beside an awesome. <laughs> <laughs> really. She does a fantastic job. <laughs> Thank you for yeah. really bringing that to our so attention. Her staff. <laughs> I mean, really, they, they um, as you, you said, Rick, all of the things that they're processing and they're, they're doing is just yeah. good stuff. Thank Thanks, you. Thank Thanks. you, Bruce. Thanks, Library. 610. <coughs> Thank you. If you give us one moment, just to get everything together here. I'd like to thank Kim Donovan also for putting the tabs and on these books. Very They're helpful. Very, very helpful. I'll defer to Judy Gilligan. Well, thank Judy for us tomorrow, would you? Thank you. Is it, uh... Hey there, if you'd introduce yourself and for the record and read the mission statement, then we'll take it from there. Hey, I'm Kathleen Meeker. I'm the director of the Situate Town Library. Um, the mission statement reads as follows. The Situate Town Library as a community center supports the cultural and educational <coughs> needs of the people of Situate regardless of age and ability. It provides a professionally managed collection of easily accessible materials in a variety of formats, support for formal and self-directed learning, access to the internet, a repository of information on the heritage of Situate, and an inviting setting for community interaction. Thank you. Uh, again, Kathy, I think we all uh, are well aware of the great work you all do over there, and, and, and we thank you for it. Uh, I know you have, like everyone, fiscal issues and financial issues to deal with, and certainly this year they're not any easier. But if you'd like to point out anything, any of your goals for the coming years that you would like to uh, try to attain, we'd be more than happy to listen. Um, in response to your comments, um, like every other department, we're busier than usual, and we've kind of posting our uh, accomplishments on our sign that's outside the library. Um, I would say we, we are greatly affected um, by the number of early childhood, the demands for early childhood programs, and thanks to the Friends of the Library, we've been able to increase our programs, and we're now providing 
between five and seven weekly programs um, for birth through probably age five. Thanks to our new team, <coughs> we're also doing many more after-school programs and programs that keep uh, kids from 10 and up busy. And of course, we're really responsive to people who are looking for jobs. And a lot of them spend a lot of quality time at the library during this period um, when they're at loose ends. Um, in respect to our goals, one of the things that we need to accomplish this year, and some of you will remember it from the past, is we have to do um, a survey of the community because we really, one, are mandated by the state, and two, we think it's vitally important for us to be really responsive to the needs of the community. So throughout this year, we will be um, surveying the community. We're hoping to do it again, perhaps at town meeting. We did it five years ago. Um, we'll be using our uh, website as well, and we're planning to hold focus groups and, and any way we can get interaction from within the community. We're also looking at, at doing a building plan and um, the possibility of refurbishing the, the library as we know it. Um, and then as you can see from our other goals, we're actually always looking for cost-cutting um, measures and we're going to continue to do that. Even though we feel that we're really heavily used, we know we can get reach farther into the community. So we're going to be looking for ways to do that as well. Um, we use quite a few volunteers, and, and I'll show you the report that, I ever, that I've done for the town report, and it really goes into all the detail of what we've done and what we hope to do. Um, and we, for those of you who know our meeting room situation, we're looking at um, trying to expand the use of it during the day. Thank you. I'd also like to introduce Chris Meraki on, on the board. I'm a member of the board. Yep. Thank you for coming. Comments from the board? Well, John, oh, go ahead. John, go ahead. Well, no, no, that's, that's, uh, let Tony go first. Well, just, right. just a couple of financial things that, that jumped out. There's the, the printing of forms right. that never used, wasn't in there before, I guess, that has the $13,000. Some of that was incorporated into other lines in our budget before, and um, up till now, our lines were pretty much restricted. I, w I wasn't encouraged to divide them up any further, so that actually was in the budget pretty much before. It? Okay. Um, it's just better defined now. And then the equipment, not much, but a three thousand dollar. Is there something that's earmarked for? Well, we have thirty computers. Um, $3,000 is about... Want to replace one? <laughs> well, it actually would replace more than one, but to me, it's the minimum requirement for us to replace one or two if, if they should suddenly go during this year. We, we hope to keep them all going, but um, I think that's a realistic amount to put aside for replacement. The only other thing I'll comment, there was something in the paper, I don't know, it was last week or the week before, that showed the amount of usage of libraries mm -hmm. from out-of-town people. And I was, I was, you know, surprised at the amount of people that use our libraries that aren't from Situate. Right. You know, we were one of, certainly in the top five, I think, of the amount of users that are coming from other towns to use our... Actually, the overall usage has almost always fallen between five and ten percent of our, of our circulation. Um, we mainly draw from Cohasset, Norwell, Marshfield, and Hingham. Um, of course, a lot of situate people as part of the Old Colony Network go out to these other libraries as well. Actually, in comparison to Hingham, um, our out-of-town usage is a little less. They, mm. They're up, up to like 25%. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's part of what makes the Old Colony Library system and the reciprocal borrowing um, such a, a great service for all of us that um, we're allowed to seamlessly go to the other libraries and they're allowed to come to us with their library card and um, it's great, especially for school assignments. John. Just, uh, Kathy, has there been any, and, and Chris, any, um, um, I say consideration or discussion with the other libraries to think about maybe, I want to say some form of consolidation as far as like um, trying to eradicate any duplicate things. In other words, I know like if with the Old Colony Library, I'm assuming that if the book is in here, you can get it from one of the other things. But, you know, to try to think about sharing costs, is there any um, 
Well, we're always... I mean, we talk about it with certain other entities, whether it's, you know, ambulance sharing right. and maybe in the future. Has there, has there been any consideration about well, that? Well, the old county library network itself is a very efficient way for libraries to share materials. Um, we went live in 1992, and the change was just phenomenal. Um, mm. when, you, when you open up the vista of all the other libraries in the area, and actually it's open statewide um, through the, what we call the virtual catalog. Um, so when we order, we look and see what other libraries are doing, and if, if it's something that's uh, questionable, whether we need a copy or not, if we see one close by or we know that it can be delivered, we often refrain from ordering that. And certainly for school assignments, if we were to just um, buy materials in response to the demand we have from our schools, um, we would have to have a much larger budget by having teaching the children to be able to place holds from their school or home. Um, that's probably the best cost saving measure there is. I don't know if you're aware, but within the state, we also are in a cooperative purchasing um, plan where all the libraries in the state go out to bid for books and the special library processing materials that are in my budget. Um, so there wouldn't <coughs> even be any cost savings in two libraries getting together hoping to achieve that savings. Um, meantime, we're all looking for other ways um, and I'm sure some of you have heard about the Norwell Hanover mm -hmm. um, considerations. Um, that's the first in this area I've seen, and, and it's a pretty drastic consideration that to me hasn't gotten con enough planning and uh, study. I wouldn't go so far to suggest that. I'm just saying that to think a little bit long term mm -hmm. and to suggest, you know, what are there areas that are overlap? And it's not necessarily with South Situate, I mean, Norwell or Cohasset or, or Marshfield, but I mean, just something to look at in the future. Yeah. Again. We've applied for grants cooperatively, um, actually, Cohasset, Norwell, and Situate, um, which takes the money that we get from the state and uses it um, more efficiently. We work together and, and are in communication mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Thank you. Thank you. Anything? Nope. Answer my question. Well, I just want to say to both of you, folks, <coughs> I really enjoyed your mission statement. <laughs> That's kind of a weird thing to say, I understand. But, um, you know, you mentioned right up front the library as a community center, and then you end with an inviting setting for community interaction. And I just wanted to draw attention to and reiterate to me at least, a lot of the importance of a library in addition to the books and the computers and the programs, which are wonderful, and my children are down there all the time, as you know. Um, but it really is uh, a place for people to go, particularly in a late afternoon. You're located near the junior high school in the high school, and um, uh, it can be a refuge for students to go um, and uh, be able to do their thing. And I think the role of a library in the fabric of the community is a, is a really important thing. And uh, I just really appreciate you acknowledging that uh, explicitly by putting those sort of community interactions in your mission statement. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Can I ask one quick question before Kathy's? Um, um, a citizen asked me the other day, and it may even be in effect, I'm not sure, does the library have textbooks in it from the different classes? You know, if, if a student wanted to do homework at the library, is there a textbook available to them there? No. At one point, we, we started that program, and then the schools provided us with um, a set of textbooks. It was just impossible to keep up, um, and it hasn't been done in, I venture, 15 years. Really? That may be something to look into, some sort of, you know, collaboration between the two. I mean, we do the best we can to yeah. provide students with the information they need to complete their assignment, but we cannot provide them with their exact textbook. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, the board. Thank you Thank both. You. Thank you. Board of Health. Do you know that? Again, Jennifer, if you would just introduce yourself for the record and, and uh, read the mission statement, we'd appreciate it. Sure. I'm Jennifer Selvin, Director of Public Health. 
And our uh, mission statement for the Board of Health is to provide prevention services and to promote and protect the public environmental health for the town of Situate. Thank you. We understand this has been a particularly trying year for mm -hmm. not only our own health department, but every health department in the state and the country, I guess. So we appreciate all you've done in that area. Uh, any questions for the board? Well, the one the one drop in the in the number side of things is in the part time help. Is there something s specific that that that's causing that? Nursing hours. Uh, We've cut the nursing hours. Yes. Um, our um, regular part time nurse Eileen Scotty retired a year ago, and Rick asked her to stay on for eight hours, and that's all she can do. Um, in accordance with her financial situation. And we're finding, um, especially in this trying fall that we've had with both flu vaccines and the changing information and um, hurry up, have a clinic game that we keep playing, um, that it really isn't enough. And it you know, has put an undue burden on her as well. Um, so, I, you know, there's other areas that are getting, aren't getting the attention I think they need. So we've, she was originally at 26 hours. Um, my budget reflects 20 hours for next year. That was questions okay. for the board. Anybody? Rick's okay. John's okay. John looks okay. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again, like like always, for all you're doing. Thank Thanks, you, Jennifer. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> that concludes uh, department. departmental budgets. We have the capital plan budget review. That's enough. I'd like your assistant chance. This should be in the uh, should be in your uh, your blue. Your agenda book, blue book, as I'm calling it, is your agenda book. And uh, number eight, fiscal year 2011 capital budget request, town side. Uh, we noticed and we know you've been meeting conscientiously for months, and uh, we certainly appreciate that. And it, the town should do the capital program is so important. We also noticed that a, a great deal, a great number of the things you've been talking about and things that are needed, to be perfectly honest, uh, probably won't be going forward this year. And, and we can, you know, understand why we talk about budgets, we talk about money, and, and we emphasize the things that won't be going forward are things we probably need in town. So. Uh, Thank you for all you've done, and with that, I'll, if you'll introduce yourself and. My name is Eric Penawat. I'm the chairman of the Capital Planning Committee. Thank um, you. Um, so we, we are, as you just mentioned, in the process of reviewing all the uh, proposed capital expenditures uh, for the town, uh, certainly for the next year and, and ideally for the years to come. and. Um, and this process uh, is, you, you've seen the same presentation that we have seen, uh, because when the different departments came in front of us, they came in front of you after that, and there are a few more to go through uh, before we can put together a list and sit down uh, with the town administrator and I believe uh, uh, Tony Vignani uh, with the financial forecast and figure out any if any <laughs> source of financing are available. Um, I'm just going, going to give <coughs> you a brief overview of what we have talked about during our meetings and some comments and suggestions we have uh, so far. Uh, and first, I just want to mention that it's no surprise for anybody in this room that uh, the financial situation for the town and any town or state um, is challenging to say the least, uh, not only this year, but probably for the foreseeable future. 
And uh, I just want to point out that uh, one thing that has been of great help this year is the, uh, the new budget process that the town administrator put together, which is really helpful in uh, gathering all the numbers in a consistent way. And that's very helpful to go through different departments and kind of line up the numbers and understand what the current and future impacts can be. Um, the, the focus this year when we review different projects is definitely looking at cost benefit analysis. And what I mean by that is that there are certain investments um, that do make sense from a financial standpoint in the way that a certain investment can bring it can reduce costs significantly over uh, the, fu the short term future also can also increase revenue if it's better used across departments. So we've been focusing a lot on that um, and uh, and really the objective is to f highlight those different projects. Uh, of course, there are some like the fire department that may be considered, you know, safety issues and that would not necessarily be a pure cost-benefit analysis. Um, among the general comments that, that we've had is that um, w one thing that struck me, in fact, this year, is that comments from uh, coming from the DPW and the fire department that uh, a lot of their vehicles that they have to replace become more and more sensitive to <coughs> water and salt water. And the reason why is because modern vehicles have much more electronics in them. Mm. And that's something that struck me because what that means, if you buy, bought a, a, a truck, let's say 10 years ago, well, there was some electronics, not much. Uh, and struck me in one particular item, which is not a big deal, but it was, there was a line item for a um, hybrid vehicle, for instance, for a D DPW. And then, hmm. Does this make sense because, you know, salt, water, electricity, batteries, not such a good idea. That, that was an example that, uh, but something also to keep in mind given that there, there is some equipment, specialized equipment, especially in the fire department, that has much more electronics into it and something to keep into consideration when we decide to invest uh, into new equipment. Uh, Another theme that I know everybody's aware of and you touched upon uh, in the previous discussions tonight is to probably more systematically look where we can get economies of scale from sharing large expense items with, for instance, n well, first between departments within the town, but also with other surrounding communities. And uh, there are such programs for um, sharing the one ambulance, for instance, that, that works fine. But that could potentially be looked into and investigated for other large um, equipment items, especially those that are looming on the horizon, such as a ladder truck for the fire department. Um, as far as um, some comments we have, we reviewed the, the DPW um, uh, capital budget, and there's definitely a great effort there to look into expenses that can be shared between the water department, the DPW, and the transfer station. And I have specifically asked, and I'm going to get them uh, for <coughs> documenting kind of specific numbers in terms of cost saving. Um, for instance, there were talks about some, you know, investing in a bigger truck that could be hooked up to a snowplow and with a different system that could potentially be leveraged much more between the departments by using more of the time of the town employees and saving a certain dollar amount. And this is an example where if the dollars are there, if it's clear that the savings are there, then it does make sense, especially in hard times, it does make sense to make such an investment because then that is going to impact favorably the budget over the next, or over the lifetime of the equipment, which can be, you know, 10 years or, or more. Um, as far as the, uh, 
the fire department is concerned, there are some, some requests there that have been there for a while. Uh, and, uh, and, and as you mentioned, I mean, the, the needs are not mm -hmm. disputed at all. Uh, there is, uh, even though in the fire department there's something interesting that's coming up, which is the schedule of refurbishing ambulances, and, uh, and through our discussion, there is uh, definitely an opportunity to capture much greater revenue from the ambulance fees, something we don't do now because of some kind of s scheduling uh, conflict, and so we're not quite leveraging the assets as much as we could. And that's an example where there's a potential for increase, increased revenues. The, it appears, and we have, we have the sheet, I don't know whether you have it, the uh, capital, that's it. No, is it? Uh, that's it right there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's it there. It's the same document. Yeah. That we and it have. appears yeah. that, that, as we mentioned, there are many items brought before you in the course of the year when you discussed them all. Uh, but there appears to be four, the top four, that you're recommending to us to go forward. Is that? I'm not recommending anything right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm just sharing some observations. Uh, we, we haven't, as a committee, we have not prioritized and looked into all the items across the board, across the town, and saying we have that many resources to spend, and therefore let's prioritize across, across the departments. Um, I'm just highlighting some critical issues that came in front of us. Okay. I mean, ideally, everything I mentioned, and maybe some more, yes, we should absolutely invest in those. I mean, this is, would be money well spent, except that you need to have the money. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Uh, so, well, if this is not going to be recommended, to, uh, if this is not being recommended, I guess, tonight. No, not tonight. I, I, I am suggesting we don't get into it in any depth because some of it will come forward and some of it won't, and why bring up? I mean, we, I, we can take this opportunity maybe to clarify a few things and, ex you if know. If anyone has any questions, but I just as soon not right. get into this actual list until you are prepared no, to. No, absolutely. Yeah, no, I'm not, no, we should, we sh definitely should not go item by item right now. Thank because you. Because we need That's to take a vote. That's first. right. <laughs> I, I just looked at it like a wish list, and, and next time we see it, you would prioritize be. it, yes. I'm sure. Yes, yes. Okay. And in fact, the, the, the plan is, I think we will see the school on the 16th of February. Okay. Uh, is we we'll probably will have one or maybe two additional meetings for the capital planning uh, together to prioritize the list, review it with the financial forecast, et cetera, and then after, shortly after that, come back in front of you with the right. official and say this is what we recommend and bring it to a vote. That make, makes all the sense in the world. Right. Yep. Thank you, Rick Murray. Thank you. The committee just tonight finished reviewing all the town oh, side. Oh, okay. So the last folks you saw, actually, the library was the last one on right. the town side. Yes. And as Eric said, they'll move on to the school okay. and then have the meetings with Tony and financial forecast. Rick Murray. Just a, thanks, Mr. Chair. Just a quick clarification, not mentioning any items, but some of these things, to me, look like they might be funded out of enterprise funds. Yes. Like, so this includes stuff that would come out of enterprise funds as well as yes uh, okay thank that, you. that that list uh, includes enterprise fund as well as uh, great thank you town. Yeah. thank you yep. just um, Eric I just wanted to say uh, thank you and the committee members I know um, for the past two years you've come before us and of course we keep shooting down all these proposals it becomes out of all the committees I have to say this is the one committee that I think is the hardest because you're, you're, you're trying to refurbish and try to maintain a standard, shall we say, of, um, of equipment throughout the town. And obviously, given the financial climate in the past three years and, and obviously now, it's very difficult to be able to spend that type of money on these. So we as a board generally are trying to put it off and put it off and put it off, which I think would have an impact on the committee members. And I certainly <coughs> hope that, you, know, you can convey to them that that's not the case with us. Right. Obviously, now's the time that what your committee's doing is even more valuable, as you just stated earlier, um, creating a priorities, because obviously these things in time or are going to break down. Given the fact that they are going to break down, uh, this board needs to then to address those priorities. Uh, doing a cost-benefit analysis with the town, manager, uh, town administrator is 
is critical uh, because clearly we are doing a cost-benefit now analysis. Some people say I need it now, and yet they could probably go for another two to three, or maybe luckily four or five years, um, as opposed to something else that could break down. Um, obviously, health and safety is always a, um, a significant aspect, but I have to say that what you're doing and what your committee is doing is is invaluable. And um, clearly, you know, it was going to be one of, one of my questions was uh, prioritizing it, and that's what you're doing. And um, so I commend you on it. And um, in conjunction with the Enterprise Fund, I, I did notice one or two things. I, I was curious about the cable um, committee and, and trying to get the funds that they have that could help solve some of the requested stuff. But again, I, I commend you and I thank you. Thanks. Tony? Just a, a quick couple of comments. To, to expand on what Rick was saying a second ago, <clears throat> all the products that come from the Enterprise Funds don't affect the town budget. So they're, whether they're um, sustainable in the Enterprise Fund themselves. And that's really been the majority of our capital budget for the last right. decade, probably, Mary. And when when people look at different different aspects of the town or the school or whatever, the the town side's biggest um, drawback over the last several several years is the fact that we haven't been able to any money in our capital budget. So our roads and our buildings and our vehicles and our in the school capital plan is also in this capital plan. Those are the things that have been really hit the hardest from the town side of things. So if, if the town had, you know, millions of more dollars in their budget, there'd be a good argument to pour it back into the infrastructure of the town because that is what has been um, hit the hardest on, on this side of the, you know, the ledger. Um, so th and there, in fact, to illustrate that, there's one item that illustrates that perfectly. It's uh, replacing the asphalt in front of the fire station. Uh, the cost now is 74000 and, and change. Uh, it used to be 60000 uh, I think, last year, and it was less before. And that's a perfect example of it's like a road. You know, you've got potholes. You don't do anything. Say, well, we can live with that. But it gets worse. It gets worse. It costs more, and then it snowballs into. Uh, right. So that's what we're, we're going I, against. I think we saw at a state level what, what just about what you and Tony are talking about now, and that is adding, for example, bridges where no money was put into bridges for, for years, or very little money was put into That's bridges. Right. And all of a sudden it got to the point when they started to look at them closely that they were all in not only disrepair, they were, they were serious safety issues. You know, and uh, we have to be very conscious of the same thing happening here with our roads and, and our equipment and everything else. That if you and I would argue that tough times, in fact, create opportunities in the sense that um, I have to say the town departments, I mean, made the job easy for us over the years because it's, they never, in fact, requested something that was completely unnecessary, mm -hmm. completely something we would say, oh, obviously <coughs> we don't need that. Um, and, and this year they're making great efforts to figure out how to kind of leverage a piece of equipment across the board. And so that's, that's good thinking and that's probably something that could help financially. But Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And we'll be seeing you soon. Yes, you will. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank Eric and thank all the uh, committees and department heads that came in before us tonight. I think we're seeing as we go through this process how valuable the, the new budget process is. So uh, it's working very well. Next is a vote to rescind contracts, energy, and natural, ga natural gas. Tricia, would you like to just bring us up to date on this? Sure. I have um, two pieces of um, business for the board. Um, I think the information I included in your packet is fairly self-explanatory, but I'll, I'll go through it briefly. The um, current and prospective contracts that we have for the supply of electricity with the town weren't in accordance with the charter and the board policies. So in order to correct that um, and move forward in a more cost-effective manner, um, I'm asking the board to rescind the current uh, approval of these contracts and um, 
authorize me as a town administrator to research new contract at a favorable rate to the, the town. You have the opinion from town council attached. I want to commend my colleague, Mr. Bangert, for sort of researching this issue and um, bringing it to our attention. You'll see a few more of these in the coming select board meetings over the next few months. Um, but this first one here um, will save the town some money, um, but will also make the service that we have provided going forward um, properly operate. Thank you. Before we make a motion, comments from the board. Yeah. Just, just, just in plain terms, uh, unless John, you're I, I was just going to say, going forward, then, uh, Tricia, you're reviewing any and all contracts that are going to be, in other words, above $25,000. Trying to see those. I think Kevin was here last meeting with yeah. the change order yep. that was in excess. So anything above that, you'll and, be and, seeing. And clearly, the, the ones that had been entered into pre, um, pre exist your tenure as, as our town administrator. So that's I just want to make sure that's clear. This correct. is not has anything to do A with you. A new set of eyes sometimes finds. Sure. And well, they, they exceeded the dollar amount as well as the longevity of the contract itself in some per cases. our bylaws. In some cases, yes. Thank you. Just and according to Jim Toomey, we can, if we're already in the middle of a contract, we can break it. Is that what he was saying? It wasn't properly authorized. It was signed by someone who legally didn't have the authority to execute it. Okay. okay. So we'll have a motion. Motion, please. Move the board of selectmen vote to rescind the contracts with Constellation New Energy for the periods of December 1, 2008 to December 1, 2010, and December 1, 2010 to December 1, 2012, and further to authorize the town administrator to determine the best source of electrical energy for the town with such recommendation and award to be made by the board of selectmen at a later date. Second. A motion has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. Move the Board of Selectmen vote to ratify the action of the Town Administrator in locking in the Town's price for natural gas from November 2010 to October 2011 and to award the contract for said service to Direct Energy Services, LLC. A second for discussion on that. I just second for discussion, Sean. <coughs> on one of these backup pages, it has a list of addresses. Mm -hmm. These addresses that we currently pay for gas now, those are the service locations. There's not a building associated with it. It's a generation point. I realize that because some of them seem yeah. like they're pump houses and right. so forth. 161 Driftway. That is the uh, sewage treatment plant? It is not the, I didn't know the numbers. All right, it's not the old shelter. Okay, that was my question. Thanks. Question has been That's asked. Sec the motion has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. And on that one, I just want to note that's a 23% projected savings over our current. Outstanding. So, uh, agenda item number 10, discussion and a vote on the bylaw revision, past general laws 40A, section 5. Uh, who's best suited to speak to this? All right. Tricia. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> when all else fails. Like any request that the town would get from a zoning, the board has to officially vote to turn it over to the planning board because that starts the t statutory time clock for review. Mm -hmm. Although Kim and I sort of discussed whether it fell into that category, we did have a request from the planning board to do indeed that. And since the zoning bylaw revision is in fact a zoning revision, bylaw a zoning bylaw change, we want you to formally vote to turn it over to the planning board for the time clock purposes. Mr. Murray. No, nothing. I'm just looking at John because this is sort of his purview. No, I, I, it's uh, obviously, as, as, as we all know, uh, coming up to this town meeting, there's going to be a proposed um, uh, zoning bylaw revision. <coughs> and clearly, um, this is uh, part of the procedural aspect of being able to go through that. Um, it will be coming before this board and as well as the other uh, boards. So I guess procedurally, this is a necessary uh, endeavor so that the planning board can review it officially and, and move forward. So with that, I'll, I'll take, propose the motion, uh, Mr. Chair, if you'd like. Move that the Board of Selectmen votes to forward the proposed zoning bylaw revision submitted by the planning board and special bylaw review committee back to the planning board according to Mass General Lara's Chapter 40A, Section 5. Second. And the second. Second just, by Sean. Just a clarification. Any changes that are made to the zoning bylaws would then come back to us and then on the warrant for mm -hmm. town approval. Yep. Correct. So this is just a technicality. Yep. 
Motion has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Uh, next item Thank you. is the uh, <coughs> discussion and vote by law revisions. Should be. The next one is the uh, policy health insurance for elected officials. Um, I presented in the packet a memo to the board relative to an item um, that sort of came to my attention in terms of looking at the budget and the financial constraints we face. Um, one of the issues that um, is we've talked about um, in recent months is continuing the level of services and benefits that we provide to not only residents but employees. And along those same lines, um, some of the services and benefits that the town provides are mandatory and some are permissive. Um, in this particular instance, um, the article, the issue before the board tonight is the provision of um, health insurance benefits to elected officials. I have captured the statute for you um, under Massachusetts General Laws 32B, Section 2D, that sets out um, who qualifies for health insurance benefits um, and who we must provide them to. In um, most cases, and as the statute here indicates, it's for employees working 20 or more hours a week, and we do indeed provide those benefits to those folks. The latter part of that section, 32B, Section 2D, also allows um, health insurance benefits for elected officials to be provided, provided um, with the recognition that they may work less than 20 hours a week. However, that is the permissive part of the statute, and by, by vote of the Board of Selectmen, those benefits do not need to be extended to elected officials. In way of background, our FY11 proposed health insurance budget is $4.9 million. It's up $400,000 over FY09. And so, because of that, it's incumbent upon um, the financial folks and um, other, and me serving as the chief fiscal officer, to look at ways we can perhaps uh, look at other alternatives to controlling health insurance costs. And this is clearly one of those issues. I just passed out to you an analysis of the average cost, the average cost of a family health plan and an individual health plan at the town's annual cost. And I think you'll see the family plan is just under $10,000 a year for one employee with family plan and about $6,500 for an individual to the town. Um, in my view, um, it's uncommon that the town has not done this previously in my particular experience. Um, years ago, it wasn't an issue, but as the cost of health insurance has increased, it's something many communities, including most of the ones I've formerly served, um, the board has voted that. At a time when we are asking for concessions and benefits for all the expired union contracts, I believe very strongly it's an equity issue in terms of um, an option that the board can look at and determine whether or not it wants to extend. All that being said, um, what this proposes is not a radical change it would grandfather any elected official that is currently receiving health insurance benefits. Um, it would also allow the elected official we have working over 20 hours a week, Bernice Brown, our town clerk, to be exempt from this policy. Clearly, she's, she would be exempt from that. And, and also, if someone served an elected position, didn't serve, and came back at a later date, and perhaps had health insurance previously, um, would not be allowed to re-enroll. Um, I think one of the things that has truly been gratifying to me serving here the last seven months is the amount of participation we have in volunteerism as on our boards and committees. And um, this is clearly a benefit that is allowed to some and perhaps not all. And I, I, I think, you know, in order to level the playing field going forward, again, grandfathering anybody that may have it now, um, it, it, it's just a parity issue in my mind. So it's my recommendation to the board from a cost factor and a fairness issue as well. And I'm welcome to answer any additional comments you have. Uh, uh, 
<coughs> Mr. Chair, before we move forward, because I see Mr. Sullivan's here, um, just in the interest of disclosure, uh, six years ago, I retained Mr. Sullivan as an attorney to help me out on some some local issue. I just wanted to put that forth. I don't think it'll affect my judgment, but I wanted to give Mr. Sullivan an opportunity to say if he's got any concerns or you folks have any concerns. Thank you. Uh, I'm good with it. The board. Any comments from the board on Trisha's presentation? Well, we talked about just to find out what the scope of of it is, and I, I believe there's about a half a dozen people that are currently taking advantage of it. Um, you know, obviously it's a, it's kind of a a big change in policy, and I've just been pondering for the last day or so. Um, I don't know that I have any clear thoughts on it. I understand the cost side of it. I understand uh, that the numbers are big and they're going to get bigger in terms of health issues. Um, and I know you see the reform of it at the state level where they're making changes in terms of not getting a year for a day's worth of service, that sort of stuff. Um, but I don't know that I've completely convinced myself which way to go on this yet. I don't know if anyone else has. One thing that jumped out with your, your grandfather and those people, and if I was one of those people and I didn't you know, get reelected, and then five years down the road I did, I wouldn't have that opportunity, okay? So it's either now, continue, or not. And is there such a thing, like in my own private business, the, this whole COBRA thing, if I was on the town's insurance as an elected official, <coughs> bless you, bless you. and I continued, could I, could I pay the COBRA payment and still yeah. get that as long as there? you're on, you're eligible for COBRA. All right. But it wouldn't have any. If you weren't elected, you wouldn't be. You would have access to the to it anyways. You're not elected, right? If you weren't elected as an official in a future year, you wouldn't have access to this insurance. Regardless, you'd have it for a year, or eighteen months, whatever Cobra is. Oh, Col would, I don't know. Cobra, Cobra just you could pay for. I mean, it's up to eight, right eighteen, 18 months. months. Oh, is that all it is? I didn't know. Yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, discussion with the board. I'll. I'll, I'll uh, so this is this is this is um. Selectmen, assessors, planning board, no, elected no. officials, oh, planning committee with, with the salary. I so believe. it's all elected. All elected officials. Well, this year, the planning board is never covered for insurance. I always thought that it's I, with it's with a salary. That's my understanding of right. the law. Now, this, keep in mind, the salary we we just the salary is. Very very small. We're not talking stipend. big salary, but it's a stipend the salary. The statute is in but front of some, you, and that's yeah. all inclusive. It doesn't. It doesn't mention salary. It doesn't mention salary. Okay. The, the way it's been situated has been the assessors and the selectmen. It's right. never been offered. As I understand, it's never been offered to the planning board. Right. There would be no way to refuse someone if they enrolled because there's no documented policy. Okay. Well, if the, so, uh, so then, so um, I'm very pleased about the idea of grandfathering because I just think that's fair and the right, <coughs> thing, the right thing to do. I do worry about a slippery slope that in the future, a future board of selectmen could say, well, we're gonna take away the grandfathering as budget cuts get, get more extreme. And so I don't know if there's any protection we can put into this that would make this ironclad for the grandfathering because I just don't wanna, um, you know, Yank the rug out from the people yeah. that are that the grandfather. Is there any way we can do that? No, you can't bind a future board. Mm. Yeah. Right. I mean, just as a prior board, if ever had a discussion about it, this board would have it. it again, it says may, it doesn't say shall, so a future board could revisit could, it okay. at a certain What's time. Yep. But I think it's only okay. fair to grandfather folks who enjoy the privilege now. Oh, I, I totally agree yeah. with that. Yep. Okay. I, uh, I was, I guess, referring to a lot of. And I look at the date, 1992, uh, from an attorney who stated that time, Section 2 of Chapter 32B, uh, makes it very clear that elect elected person who is compensated. Okay, so I still no, but that's it. And that letter's to me, so. Oh, uh, that's, <laughs> th yes it is. It is to you. <laughs> Where is the Why actual? Why would it be dated? When she was in a separate town. In Springfield. Why it was well, dated, I've done this in other communities. Yeah. I didn't even think you were in this business in 1992. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> right out of high school. Pretty thick around here, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so is this the is the thing in the memorandum? Is this the 
the general law? Yeah, that's excerpted right from the general law. Because in this it says appointed. Oh, it says uh, employed, appointed, or elected. Right. Well. But everybody who, most people, if you're employed, you're working over 20 hours a week. We don't give gotcha. benefits to no, employees. My concern is the appointed. We don't give benefits to employees working less than 20 hours a week. Right. All right. The, uh, I guess the no, main points of this, this, if I could just summarize them. This is going forward from now on. It would not affect the current employees uh, receiving that benefit. With that, if I don't, I don't see anything else from the board. One, and Brian, I think you're sitting patiently there. Uh, Thank you, Joe. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> uh, briefly, to address something that uh, Mr. Vignani raised, uh, I believe the clause where it mentions appointed is that sometimes uh, people are appointed and they're compensated to fill a vacant seat. In the case of attorney Steve Gard, who serves on the Board of Assessors, he now gets the benefit and would get the benefit prospectively. Um, th I think that's why there's that, that reference to someone who is appointed. And he's filling out the remainder, um, or he's filling the seat until he has to run for, uh, for election. Right. He's not running for re-election because he's not yet been elected. He's appointed, then he has to run for election. He, I, I'm told he's taken out his papers. So uh, he'll be running for election this spring, uh, and he receives the benefit. Um, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for, for hearing me out on this. Uh, I think this is a very important issue. If you vote uh, tonight to support the uh, motion of, uh, of the town administrator, there will be no savings. You will not realize any savings this year or maybe even next year if assuming someone uh, has, is up for re-election. This is something that you may or may not realize a savings somewhere down the road. And the question is, what's the cost and then what's the benefit? And um, I am protected, presumably, today. Who knows? You know, you guys could, as, as uh, Mr. Murray points out, pull the rug out from underneath us next year. Who knows? Um, but for now, we're protected. And the question is, why is this benefit afforded to you folks, to uh, the Board of Assessors? And I think the idea is, is so that so you, you get folks that are the best qualified for the different positions in which they serve. And uh, I respectfully disagree with the town administrator, uh, whether or not it's a question of parity or fairness. I think that people that serve on the Board of Selectmen, people that serve on the Board of Assessors, um, donate a tremendous amount of time, energy, effort, and expertise from their various professions to their jobs and that's one of the reasons why I think I happen to think the town of Situate is so extraordinarily well run in addition to that the Board of Assessors is well run speaking as the chairman it has been many many years over 10 years since the town has been overturned on an appeals case uh, to the appellate tax board where the town has sustained a loss in excess of a thousand dollars the losses that we have sustained have been nominal one of the reasons for that is that we have had extraordinarily highly qualified people serving on the Board of Assessors. And one of the reasons that they serve is because of this benefit. We had uh, Brian Chalou, who was the tax title attorney for the City of Boston for over 25 years. We had Tim O'Brien, who was the head of the Appellate Tax Board, who served for, for several years on our board, recently resigned. We had uh, Bob Brooks, who is one of the top five Appellate Tax Board attorneys in the state of Massachusetts. We hired him to help us on the uh, arch archdiocese case. The archdiocese tried to hire him because they knew how good he was. But he was on, he's on our case. Um, we have been very lucky to have qualified, experienced uh, individuals who are serving, who do not have an agenda, who are not out with an ax to grind, who are out to serve the town. And one of the reasons that we have these people and they have served has been because of this benefit that has been afforded to the Board of Assessors. And my concern, again, it's not necessarily for me because I would be grandfathered today, but going forward, if this benefit is rescinded and going forward you get people who uh, are not as qualified, but they get on the board because they want to uh, put forward a, a certain agenda, you're going to get less qualified people, and I think the benefit or the savings that you may realize on the one hand, you may end up paying in the, in the long run in increased legal <coughs> fees, 
due to uh, appeals because the board is not acting properly, and of course you, the uh, the specter of losing appellate tax board cases because the board is acting with unqualified people or less qualified people who have uh, a certain agenda when they get on the board. That's the concern that I have for the integrity of the board going forward. Let me just uh, comment, I guess, Brian. Are you saying that people who do not avail themselves of this insurance, whether they be on the Board of Assessors or wherever, are not as qualified as, as uh, those who avail themselves? Absolutely of not. Well, but you, you, you gave that impression to me anyway, and I, I know you didn't want to do that, but you said that, and jump in if I'm wrong, that uh, these well-qualified people that you mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm assuming they all took advantage of the insurance. Brian Shalou and yes. they all did, as far as you know, they yes. all did. Yes, yeah. the, the people serving on the Board of Assessors, And yes. the people who didn't s take advantage of that insurance over the past 20 years, 25 years since Brian Shalou, they were just as qualified, weren't they? Well, again, people serving on the Board of Assessors have to take a 40-hour course uh, sponsored by the Department of Revenue. And, and typically, you get people who have a legal background, typically they're lawyers, who are, are, again, who have the, the background to understand the, the rules and regulations of assessing, and, and those folks have come forward in the past and have served on the board. But not everybody who has served on the board has, uh, has taken advantage of the, the, the benefit in terms of the health coverage. But it's not to say that if they don't get the health coverage, they're not qualified. I don't intend to convey that okay. impression. Thank you. Um, I hesitate to argue with a, with a lawyer, but I'm going to give it a try here. Um, a different way of looking at this, perhaps, would be one could imagine, and I absolutely honestly am not casting any comment on anybody now who, is, who would be grandfathered or anybody at all, but one could imagine in the future, though, we might get someone who, in fact, isn't qualified, is not qualified, and is only doing it because of the health care benefit. So I think it could flip, in theory, back and forth. I think there's two sides of the coin on that. That is possible. I would just want to reiterate that that's not a comment at all about anybody getting the benefit now, but that's the other side of the coin there. Well, also, you could get into a scenario where <clears throat> somebody runs against somebody, you know, kind of with the tagline that I don't cost the town $10,000 um, and may get a less qualified person in, in the seat as well. I, I, my, um, I understand we can't tie the hands of future boards, but to, um, but to clearly, clearly telegraph the sense of at least this board, if this board passes this, you know, I, if we're legally able to, even though it might not stand up, but again, in terms of broadcasting where we're coming from, if we could stick the word permanently in front of grandfathered or something like that, if we can, just. I'll see how we well, could. that? Right on the on the motion here. Well, what do you mean? So you're going to tie the he, you're going to tie the hands of future boards of selectmen. Well, I just want to make sure that the grandfathering we do everything possible to make clear. Maybe the minutes is sufficient, and I don't. And maybe maybe that's fine. I, see I, what, I really I, want to make sure that the grandfathering thing is as bulletproof as we possibly can make it, even if it fundamentally can't be bulletproof just intrinsically. See so what you're, you're saying? Why don't we say that uh, last call is going to be 10 o'clock forever? At any any liquor establishment, same thing, right? Yeah, I got you. The board, I think the the, you know, the future board of selectmen, Rick. Uh, no, I got you. Regardless of which way we voted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tonight, if we didn't no, vote that's, tonight, that's fine. Yep. Could change in five years from now. You know yep. what I mean? I see what you're getting at, and I. But let me ask this: Is it a sense of the board that if this were to pass, that the uh, that the grandfathering, the sense of this board, that the grandfathering is is important? Absolutely. I would say it is. Absolutely. All right. Shot, what, what's, uh, what's the cost again, Trisha? I can see it here. The town share would be for a family plan, ten thousand, mm -hmm. and the town share for an individual <coughs> is the fifty-three forty-seven right. percent split. So that represents fifty-three percent of the total cost. And an individual is half, half that, about five thousand. Yeah. Right. And we're talking maybe five to seven people over here. No, these, those people aren't affected at all. Yeah. And going forward, it, it going sure. forward, that would be the, the maximum savings would be seven times whatever. Whatever, 10,000. Yeah. Okay. I mean, no doubt it will save money in the future. You know, yeah. um, 
who knows what the dollar amount will be, but at some point in time, someone would get elected that would want it that wouldn't have access to it. But I can see where Brian's coming from, too. I put myself in, like, you know, the employer's seat, you know, and, you know, how do you get a better employee, you know? That's if it came down to that. Yeah. I, I, and then I can a, see what Rick says. You might play, though. <laughs> <laughs> but if yeah. that's the case, open it up to the planning board and conservation commission and, you know what I mean? Well, they're not, that's, they're not that was the criteria. If, so, I mean, so what, what uh, are they, if that are they the criteria that we should, okay, let everyone do it, you know, but if, well, we, if we knew we were going to get better, I argue okay. that, that the people, no, but get we clarified that the statute says compensated. Compensated. Yeah. So therefore yeah. that's, so it's just, that it's it's again, right. we we'll get back to, I, I, I argue that hopefully, hopefully this perk isn't, uh, the sole reason people right, right. serve on committees, you know, I'm sure it isn't. But, uh, yeah, I, I, my first involvement with the town was not uh, running for the Board of Assessors. No. Uh, further discussion from the Board? Uh, off of the floor. So, yes. How many hours are they talking about an employee working there? Is that under 20 hours on, on an elected official? 20 hours, yes, yeah. So I don't see what the, where that benefit should even be coming in. From my own standpoint, from, you know, most, most people that work part time don't get any kind of benefit. That That's you know, right. 20 hours a week. I don't see where that, that's a major thing for, for somebody to serve on a board or, or to be running for elected, elected officials. We're working, we're, we're Working on the assumption that the, the individuals, so people, people are talking about work those 20 hours a week. But she's saying it's under 20 hours a week. Or like under 20 hours a week. Right, it says that the benefit can be granted it to can elected be granted. officials who may be working less than yeah, 20 hours if, a week. Maybe. So the people that they're talking about grandfathering in, are they working under 20 hours a week now? Yes, some of them are, yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, I'm going to um, make a motion to get a motion on the floor. I'd love that. Move the Board of Selectmen pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 32B, Section 2D, vote a policy of not extending the benefits noted in the aforementioned law to elected officials with the following provisions. One, that the elected position of town clerk is exempt from this policy. Two, that any elected officials currently receiving benefits be grandfathered without any loss of coverage as long as they serve their elected term. And three, that should an elected official have a lapse in service and then return to elective office, he or she shall not be, shall not be able to enroll and receive said coverage. Motion's been made. Motions were made. Does not appear to have a second unless I hear a second. You know what, I'd like just a little bit more time to think about it. Is it unreasonable to, to discuss it in our next meeting? No. I don't think I don't so. Know. I mean, I'm not. <clears throat> I'm fine with that as well. If that's. Uh, right. I just put the motion out there to get, if we think to get a sense of where we're it. going here. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this is a big policy change. And I'd like to I, think about it a little I bit I agree more. with Tony. Right. We will, uh, Kim, keep this agenda right o open, and we will hopefully vote at the next meeting. The 16th? Yep. I don't think, we've had pretty good discussion on it, so I don't think it uh, would take a lot of time unless someone comes up with something new. So if we could postpone that to the next meeting, that would be great. Next item on the agenda. Thank you. Motion for some death. Is to vote a drain layers license renewal. Motion. Motion. Move that the Board of Selectmen vote to renew the following drain layers licenses for James K. Rock Jr., Dandel Construction, McDougal Brothers, Jones Contracting, Inc., and Jason Geary for the year 2010. Second. Motion to be made and seconded. Any discussion from the board? <coughs> Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. Item 13. What a motion? Please. 
Sure. Sure. Move that the Board of Selectmen vote to renew the septic disposal license for McGonagall Septic Services for the year 2010. Second. Motion and made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And that's unanimous. Uh, next town administrator's report. Um, just a few brief highlights. Um, as I think I mentioned at the last selections meeting, um, we were at the mid-year point of the fiscal year, and so um, Mary and I looked at all the departmental accounts and asked for explanations for any budget that was more than 60 cent percent expended. Um, I'm happy to say that um, in the majority, probably 97 percent of our accounts are on track to look good. Um, there were a few exceptions, and I've contacted those departments, but overall, I think that um, we're in good shape and probably can avoid some of the sort of the frenzy in past years that have happened with sort of year-end transfers. Um, I don't think we've tapped into the reserve fund at all yet which is good because I think we'll probably need to make a substantial appropriation into the unemployment line item, which I think will be exhausted by the end of this month, the 300000 appropriation that we had. So, um, so unfortunately, that puts a little more pressure on other departments to hold spending in line because of that unanticipated increase. Um, Second thing is tomorrow is the first meeting of the technology committee that um, I've formed. I've invited eight staff members to serve on it. Um, I think I've included a copy of the invitation letter, and which sort of sets out the charge of that committee. Um, I sort of see this group as a precursor to do a lot of the groundwork and lay the foundation for establishment of an IT department if we get the IT director position funded, which is still. 14 months away. It's a cross-section of folks from um, all different departments. And um, we're also uh, engaging um, the IT director at the town of Marshfield, who's a graduate student at Suffolk right now and um, is working on a special project. And one of that is uh, to identify a project that can help um, result in a better management or project or whatever. So he's put together a survey document for us that I'll be sharing with the committee tomorrow to start that process. And, and the last thing that I note here is um, Dick Eckhouse, uh, who um, some of you may know from working on the Marine Park, the retired um, computer science professor. He reviewed the job description for the IT position that I have in the budget and has provided some excellent feedback as well. So we have a lot of different and good community resources, I think, to help us move forward with this, and we'll just sort of plow ahead. Yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions on that. The final thing is um, sort of this whole notion that I spoke with Joe about after we had, I thought, was a very successful meeting, informational meeting for residents about sewers in the town, when they'll get them, how we decide, where they go, how to connect, and things like that. And I was struck by the fact that over the past several months, the board's had a number of meetings, such as the Water Resources Committee, and trying to educate folks about the watershed and storage issues, and also seawalls, and you know, you know, sort of educating folks that you know, a, you know, a part of the seawall falling may not mean it's going to breach, and you know, just to let people know signs versus just erosion of deterioration, and sort of trying to coalesce all these things together and put them under the umbrella of some community education forums where like once a quarter or every few times a year the board would sponsor one of these educational forums at the library or GAR hall where we'd invite the community just to talk about sort of these issues that are really you know in some ways unique to um, situate. We've done that um, in some ways already each year we do the um, storm rating informational center, um, sessions that Vinnie and Laura have at the library to let people know about hazard mitigation and the elevation grants and things like that. But I think this can be a more sort of formalized, um, st um, structured way in which we can just get information out to the community about issues that, you know, you sort of don't have a lot of time in a meeting sometimes to get into the depth. 
that you wanted to do. So I just, it's a food for thought kind of item. Yeah, I think it's open up to the board, but I think it's a good idea. It's just, again, it wouldn't be on a monthly basis. It might be three times a year, it might be twice a year. That's a great idea. But just issues that, that may never come before the board, but, uh, uh, you know, are of an interest to everyone in town. I think it's a great idea. Um, and I think that's what we talked about through the interview process with the candidates that we talked about this, that we we're looking for someone that would drive the educational and informative part of the town back to the citizenry. So I think it's awesome. If it, Fantastic. If it went like that meeting, and I was going to thank Joe for putting it on, Tricia, Al was there, Kevin, you know, uh, another night out for those people. And the people in the audience were, you know, those neighborhoods that, you know, have unique situations um, that need sewers. And it was, you know, I, I know I left that night and learned a few things, and it was it, it was great. There wasn't any, you know, and, and people in general, it gave everyone a, an opportunity to ask questions, and uh, Al and Kevin were there, and it was just focused on that particular issue. It was great. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, let's go forward with that if, if in the future. I, I have a question, uh, Tricia, with respect to the um, unemployment that you had said the, the amount has gone up. What, what's the numbers of uh, town employees who are now become have become unemployed, so to speak? Uh, is that number, I assume, is continuing to rise? Is that the reason why the number uh, is continuing? You're talking about going into potentially the reserve fund because the number for unemployment is going up, or is that an expected, are you anticipating potentially Well, uh, it's, a, it's a good question. There's a couple things. Yes, there's more than we've had in many previous years. I think our total expenditure <coughs> last year was less than 60000 Right. Um, is, and some of it is the federal government has extended additional benefits. Usually the state supplements that. They are not. Um, and some people leave the service of town and go and take another position and perhaps have been laid off for that position. They go back, when you're on unemployment, they can go back up to, I forget, I want to say 56 weeks or something like that. So. There's some people who were off and then have come back on because they lost the position mm -hmm. that they left us for. And so we're carrying people longer, too. So yes, we have more. We're carrying more folks than we have in the past, but also they're there longer, or the circumstances have changed where people we normally wouldn't have seen are back on back the road. Okay. Just to add to that, John, the majority of them, I believe, are from the school. Okay. People don't realize that there were a lot of layoffs last year from the school, and that was a huge reason why it jumped up so much so there were um, I, I asked that because I, yeah. I didn't I wasn't aware of too many on the town side so that's yeah. why I was trying to get a gauge as to where they were coming three. from three. Three. That's what I thought. probably for situations like you've said I as to the as to the seminar kind of like the, the, the seminar and the forums absolutely I, you know, I, I was focused on the budget issue but I was thinking um, I, you know I'd heard about it from Joe and and I have to say you know kind of a prospective approach to these situations or potential situations um, obviously is a great opportunity for the town and for as a forum for people to go out and talk to and say hey wait a minute these are potential issues but likewise it's also very beneficial for them to understand you know the constraints that the town has and some of the problems and the priorities so I, I, it goes both ways so again I wasn't trying to shortchange the forum but uh, anyway thanks other business uh, yes regard to the information uh, education forms. Mm -hmm. The one that Vinnie Kalicious does is specifically for the purpose of getting community rating system points, which in turn lowers right. health insurance premiums for situate residents. So I would think, and I'm inspired as you say that, I would think that any suggestions that anyone has <coughs> um, topics of interest Oh, yeah, they can do as part of the community rating. System. That's a good point. Maybe we could, Trisha, maybe we could, yeah, we could ask Vinny if there's any subject that, that he could That's present. That's a great idea. That he could think that would fall under that umbrella would be great. We could educate the people as well as get points for us. So. Yes. Good point. Other business? Rick? No, Um, I'll follow the same model I did two weeks ago. I think Tony might be saying something about the school meeting that we all were at, so I'll chime in at that point. But other than that, nothing on my own. Although I will say the word waterways just <laughs> because I needed to get that in somewhere. Tony? Um, I think what Rick is referring to, last week there, were, um, there was a meeting Thursday night 
which was kind of a joint PTO meeting where the school committee got got in front of quite a few people. I would guess between 100 and 200 people at, at Cushing um, and went over their budget and the process. And um, I found it to be a very good informational message out to people and, and they, they told them a lot about what was going on. There were a lot of questions about the process and how the town and the school work and all this sort of stuff. And they really laid out um, their budget and their deficits that they're having to deal with. Um, and then again on Saturday morning, I know Trisha was there and Rick was there and I was there and Joe was there. Um, the same thing. And it was probably about over 100 people I would say were there and a different group and same type of thing. They ran through the budget. There's a million and a half dollar deficit there, and um, a lot of people had questions about why and how it's going to be, um, how it's going to be resolved, and what what different options are there, and a lot of different things were thrown out. Um, but I really think there's several hundred more people in the town that understand the process a lot more. Um, the school came through and gave a preliminary list of cuts that they'd have to make, and um, and it includes people, as I'm sure everyone um, expects. And, uh, and probably some programming. There be, be a, you know, they gave a little listing of elementary school teachers and Gates and, and high school teachers and there'll be programming involved and, and uh, some sports programs and all this sort of stuff in order to make their, their numbers work. Um, my concern about it is that it's, I don't know that they have the plan yet that is gonna be a sustainable model so that year after year we don't have to deal with this with this issue in terms of um, coming up with a deficit. They have a very, very high residual payroll and, um, and in these times that we have right now, the town's not gonna be giving them a lot more money. So I know that they are working very, very, very hard to figure out what the master plan is. It was very encouraging for me to know that they have an interim plan that will um, get us through the next year while they can kind of figure out what the, what the bigger picture is gonna be. Obviously, there's discussions of overrides and there's discussions of <coughs> um, other sources of money and state funding and so forth. I don't think any of that has really come to, to fruition yet, but you know, people are talking and thinking about donations and, and a hundred other things. So um, it's good to see that people are thinking that there's a lot of people involved and certainly the school committee has made every effort to make everybody aware of the fact that there is a deficit. It's gonna be difficult to make it up and there will be changes in the way that the school system is run. That was Thank my you. take on it. Thank you. Yeah, I just add on that Superintendent Martin and Bill Bill Johnston, chair of the school committee, once again did a great job and with Jamie it. Jamie on Wednesday night. And Jamie Stravino. Yep. Yeah, and uh, you know we kind of played tag team. You, Tony spoke a lot about the finances of, of the town and, and how it all worked in, in terms of the numbers. And I and I want just to point out to people and, and I, their eyes really widened a lot when Tony was saying things and I said some things, just along the lines of you know 83 percent of the school budget is personnel. And whether you like it or not, and I didn't get into any of the politics of that, but personnel costs go up 3% or 3.5% or whatever. And that's a bigger number than 25 And so there's fundamentally a structural problem, which Tony was talking about in terms of like, do they have the, the long-term thing figured out or are we gonna be doing the same situation next year? And so I think people are now starting to, to, to think longer term on that. And I also, trying to, to to break down some of the barriers between town side and the school side, although their budget is much greater than ours, you know, every, every, every action that decreases the quality of education is gonna somehow affect, affect the town in the sense that we're, it's gonna affect our growth rate, receipts, and all this, because you know, when you're, you're looking for a real estate agent and they looking for a new house, one of the first pieces of paper they give you is the ranking of the schools and how important the schools is to the overall, not only the fabric and the culture of the community, but actually the finances of the community. So these things are all, are all linked together. Um, override sort of came up, didn't come up. People recognize that, I think the school committee did a good job articulating this, that if an override is going to come up, it needs to be driven from the citizens. It's not gonna be coming from the school committee. It's gonna be coming from the citizens. The school committee would decide whether to support it or not, as would we and, and all this. But it, and involve the town. And involve the town. It's not, it's not gonna be something that's gonna come down from above, as it were. It really needs to be brought out <coughs> uh, from the grassroots side. And that's just one of many options that people are considering. And I just think, again, just like Trisha's idea about getting the quarterly meetings out there, the more meetings they have, they're doing a very good job getting word out. And uh, that, that's it. 
have one other thing, Joe, on a lighter note, much lighter note. Uh, economic times are tough right now, and it's tough to get good, cheap entertainment. Last night I went to the Situate High School basketball game for $4. I saw the best basketball game I've ever seen in my life, bar none. You could not get this entertainment from the Celtics. And it, you've got a, a basketball team here that's 12-2, and two, that's been to state finals in two of the last three years, and they are playing some phenomenal, phenomenal basketball right at the high school gym. The turnout is very good. Um, like I said, the ticket's $4. Last night they played another team that was 12 and one. It came down to the buzzer. We had a, a player that had his finger dislocated. He came back in the game and, and played the second half and it was just great, great entertainment. And not only with the basketball, but the hockey team, you've got great high school sports going on here that is available to everybody. And Get involved. There's a lot of people that go to these games. You'll see people that you know, and it's a very, very fun activity and shows your community spirit. So um, um, I highly, highly recommend that you get out and see these teams play. Tony, thank you. John, anything? Just one thing I had mentioned to Tony earlier it had to do with Comcast and this whole thing about files coming into town. And I had a resident that asked me, and I just defer to Tony, who's on the cable. Advisory Committee, if, yeah. if give an idea to the residents that might be watching and when they could ins expect it, um, you know, are, are they getting gearing up for it now and is it not, you know, in their best interest financially? Is that why they're not doing it? I really didn't have all the answers. So I just defer to someone that knows. Well, my that. sense was when we did the, the negotiating the contract about six months ago that they just have a list of communities and they're going down it. I think Marshfield has it, um, but we don't have it. In fact, it, I bet Hummer Rock could get it if they had a, a wire and a tin can. But um, <laughs> but it's just a, a matter of a, a checklist. And they said they were coming to situate in the next year, year and a half. Right. So I, I would say people that are interested expect to see it soon. Um, Trish will probably know before anyone else because they'll be in here to negotiate a contract. Yeah. Um, they And then the board and Rick and, and Joe had asked me to look into it. They reshuffled the representatives who cover the regions so whoever the, and so I just got that information from John Rosner like two weeks ago who the new contact is for this purpose so I have to is, reach out is to it them. a case where they might have got more bang for their buck they would you know shorter run they would have signed up more people the no, I, I think enough. it's exactly what Tony okay. said they right. just, just got a list yeah we asked them when Comcast came up for renewal two years ago now right. mm -hmm. we, we I, I talked to Rick Agnew with we all talked about it and we had um, we had Rick approach Verizon then to see if they were interested in coming in, and they said, no, we'll, we'll come around in a couple of years. And uh, we've, just, we've just restarted this. We, we've actually been quite proactive reaching out right. to, to them to come in. And just to reassure everybody, uh, the Comcast contract that we have um, or, or agreement we have allows for competition. So we, we, we didn't sign anything that, that would restrict anybody else coming in. Thomas Wake. <coughs> John, sure, you? briefly. Uh, for those people who are looking forward to the uh, St. Patrick's Day Parade, there will be a decision by February 16th by the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, this, this weekend there is the Mad Hatter's Ball, so those people who are interested, tickets are available at Christopher's and also the uh, bookshop. Um, this may be the first year that the uh, parade is not going forward. You'll find out on the 16th. So if you can afford to um, donate to the mayor's race, by all means do so. Outside of that, that's it, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, just to not to scare people into donating. Uh, it probably will go, you know, there's no decision been made, John. Is that correct? I don't want to discourage people. No, no, no. I think what's important is that, you know, they need to have that support. They need to get behind it. And we're not talking about public funding. We're talking about private funding, the way it's always been done. And so, um, but just so <coughs> people understand, it, it, given the economic times, you know, it, things aren't easy. So, uh, you know, this community is very unique with the unique things that it has, one of which is the parades that kind of, this parade that kicks off kind of like the summer, the spring and the summer activities. So um, I only encourage people to go out. It's being held, the Mad Hatters is being held at the uh, Situate Country Club at 7 o'clock on Saturday. And like I say, tickets are available. Go out and vote. You know, in this case, you can take the old uh, daily uh, approach, vote often and early because every vote you have counts. So you, and it's based on dollars that you contribute. But, um, and there are three different candidates. So. No, it, it has not been decided it's not going to happen, but I just want to give people a sense that it is a, it's a dire situation that people need to realize, the economic times. Certainly we hear it on the school side. You're going to hear it, you know, in other areas. Next is the 
correspondence. Correspondence. We have a letter from uh, Susan Ryan. John, if you'd read Sure. That. This is from uh, Susan Castle and Ryan, um, who had written the uh, town administrator concerning an outstanding highway department employee, she, given a situation she had. On Saturday morning, January 2nd, uh, she was driving her car uh, on Allen, Allen Place. Uh, there was an early morning snow, created havoc on the streets, and highways uh, made her situation treacherous to navigate uh, with her car. As a result, her car was unable to get traction and it began to slide down the street, um, narrowly missing a telephone pole and eventually landing atop ice in a snowbank. Um, she states that she was obviously concerned, as anybody would be in that situation, wasn't sure uh, whether or not she was going to be able to get herself out of the car and from hitting a telephone pole or skidding further. Uh, as she states in her letter, luckily for me, Pedro um, Gonzalez from the highway department was sanding the street, came down front, fr from Front Street. He radioed for her assistance um, from Rick Ke uh, Capone, who was also part of the uh, highway department. Uh, he soon appeared. Uh, the two of them quickly dug her car out, sanded the street, and assisted her uh, getting out of uh, the predicament that she was in. They both acted in a professional manner with great sincerity and were genuinely interested in helping me. I'm most appreciative of their efforts on my behalf. As a longtime situate resident, I'm aware of the hard work and long hours that the highway department employees have particularly uh, donated during the snow and ice storms, uh, yet both Mr. Uh, Gonzalez and Capone were cheerful and quickly made sure that I was safe on my way. I'm extremely grateful to them. They deserve recognition for their actions. I would ask that a copy of this letter be placed in their respective personal files. Uh, sincerely, Susan C. Ryan and, uh, from Situate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, minutes? Move with the board of selectmen vote to accept the minutes for December 29th, 2009. Second. Uh, discussion, all in favor? Aye. 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 Move the board of selectmen vote to adjourn the meeting at 9.37 p.m. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.